meeting is being broadcast live, community television channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on today's agenda, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so as you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity. When it is your time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or choosing the webinar speaker raise hand on your computer. And I would like to ask the clerk, please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Antari Johnson. Present. Holder. Did you not hear me? Oh, okay. sorry, here. Come in. Here. Brown. Mayor, currently at Vice Mayor Watts, would be late, and Mayor Bernard. Present. The uh, agenda item today that we will be hearing is Climate Action Plan 2030. For members of the public who are streaming this, if Climate Action Plan 2030 is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council, and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. I would like to now hand it over to our Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, Vice West. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you and good afternoon, council members. Uh, as the mayor stated, I'm Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. And today I'd like to share with you an update on the Climate Action Plan since I last was in front of you in January of this year. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. <clears throat> Are you able to see my screen? All right, very good. I'm getting thumbs up. All right, very good. We're going to be focusing today on really funding and implementation, but we'll be um, circling back on uh, targets that we really uh, they, uh, spent a lot of time on uh, in our last study session. I do want to just acknowledge before we get started um, that the land um, that many of us are on today is uh, native land and where I'm at uh, is the ancestral grounds of the Kawasa uh, Yupi tribe, and this land is now being stewarded by the Amamut. Okay, um, just wanted to start, uh, make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what the goal is for the Climate Action Plan and what the objectives are for the study session today. So number one, the Climate Action Plan, we wanna prepare a CEQA, and CEQA California Environmental Quality Equal qualified climate action plan that state targets, and we want to determine the year most equitable pathway to carbon neutrality. So much more on that to come today. For this study session, um, the objective is for you all to receive an update on the development progress. Uh, I was last in front of you in January, and discuss considerations of funding and implementation of CAP 30. Um, and please, if I do use any terminology that is unfamiliar to you or any acronyms, I really will strive to do that. Please don't uh, feel free to interrupt me and uh, ask for clarification. I know this can be a very um, heavy kind of um, climate lingo um, type of uh, presentation, and I'm really striving not to, not to do that. Okay, uh, start. I will brush you on the major components of this plan. So working on this with the community. April of 2021, we established 
um, values and visions for this plan. We uh, set forth options for goals and targets. Let's tell at our January meeting, circle back on today. We have developed the high level measures, those are topic areas um, where the emissions reductions to take place. And we have actions, we've developed actions uh, that are the policies, programs, projects um, that will enable us to achieve both those measures and the goals of the target. All of that is wrapped together, this climate action plan which will include a funding and implementation plan both for us municipally as well as community-wide. I do want to be clear that this climate action plan is a community-wide plan. It is not just for us as for municipal operations, although that is part of this. And importantly, we have been working with our equity advisors, our climate action task force, to iteratively develop and apply a screening tool at every step of the way. And I see that reflected in the actions, the measures, um, I'm not going to go over all this, but I will say we are right here at the end of the phase three on funding and implementation. Um, and between May and July, we'll be drafting a final plan and the CEQA, Health Environmental Quality Act, to the plan. And we are targeting an on time adoption on August 9th. That will be coming. That's the next time this will be coming uh, to City Council. So let's jump right in on the part. If you recall, last time in front of you, I presented the options for our staff target. And there were two sets of uh, options for targets. Number one, the California Environmental Quality Act uh, target, which would be our legally defensible uh, a target that we would need to achieve. Um, and then we also presented options for aspirational stretch targets that would be voluntary. And if you recall the benefits of adopting equal qualified climate action plan with equal qualified targets is that we are able to develop fresh emissions thresholds for development. And in turn, those developers get streamlined environmental review process. So it's a win-win city. It is one of our biggest levers to reduce emissions in development. So we want to have a people qualified. In order to do so, we need to set uh, the greenhouse gas inventory, which we did for 2019. We need to align with state targets, see on the screen here in the upper left. And we need to track our implementation for that target. It is important to remember that with this equal qualified target, the actions need to be feasible, reasonable, implementable to achieve. And that's important to remember because it needs to be legally defensible. Uh, as was noted in the agenda report, staff are recommending SB 32 target of 40% reduction by 2030 from 1990 level as our equal qualified target. Um, we have prepared the measures and the actions and have confirmed that we are able to reach that target. That is what we have presented to the community for discussion. However, we also know for you last as well as uh, from community members that there's a strong desire to go for acknowledging that the minimum target by the state perhaps going far enough and that we wanted to adopt aspirational voluntary targets. And there are a variety of targets we would have adopted. We are recommending that we adopt aspirational target carbon neutrality 2035 for two reasons. Number one, the current state target for carbon neutrality is 2045. However, the governor has directed the Air Resources Board to go back look at bringing that target 2045 down to 2035, pretty likely. Number two, and I'm going to show you this graphic. Number two, we calculated our science-based target. The science-based target is the reductions that are required for our share of emissions that will help keep 
global temperature increase under 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the acknowledged tipping point for um, catastrophic climate um, uh, impact. And so the aspirational target, carbon neutrality by 2035 that we're recommending, is slightly more aggressive than that science-based target. So we are making this recommendation based on the fact that it is consistent with science and it is consistent with the regulatory direction of this. So those are the recommendations as contained in the uh, agenda report. Okay, and so what does that look like? Um, if we look at this graph, I'll remind you that the red line is our projected emissions if we did nothing at all. And I, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth to explain, but bumping here is because of a change in the procurement of electricity by our local electricity producers of community energy. It's an accounting kind of mechanism that that causes bump. But rest assured, by 2030, our electricity will be 100% renewable, if not sooner than 2030, because of our participation in Central Coast Community Energy. The orange is what state legislation uh, will, where state legislation will drive emission reduction, specifically around the renewable portfolio standard, which is how clean the grid is. It will be getting cleaner and cleaner because of the RPS. And then secondly, because of fuel economy, as we make those tighter for vehicles, that's also going to drive. So you see we get a nice reduction there. Now where the yellow star is, gray line, yellow star at S2, 40% reduction from 20, uh, between 20, uh, sorry, 1990 and 2030. Um, so that is the target that we're recommending. And if you allowed that line to continue, you see we'd hit uh, from neutrality by 2045. However, um, we are rec recommending the aspirational target of carbon neutrality by 2035 is this kind of yellowish line far left-hand side. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the current state target and the recommendation of 2035 as the aspirational target. And you can see the green line, which was the uh, science-based target, and we are more, uh, more aggressive, slightly more aggressive than that science-based target. And as I, as I conveyed last time, really we'll need to, in order to make progress towards the aspirational voluntary target, we're really going to need to lean into more aggressive measures. We're going to need to look to new technologies as they come them online, for example, carbon capture. We're really going to need to focus in on the carbon sequestration actions that we've specified, as well as the climate economy one. Do recall that for the CEQA qualified there's a limited set of emission reduction sources that are counted um, in that school qualified plan. Carbon sequestration is outside of that, um, as is our climate economy measure. So those really will be working towards this aspirational. And I'll be sharing those with you in just a minute. So in order to achieve those targets, we need to focus in on these cap measure areas. Transportation is the biggest, as you know, 69% of our emissions are from transportation. So active transportation, public transportation, electric vehicles, hugely important. <clears throat> Secondly, electric buildings and renewable energy, water efficiency, waste reduction, and then I have carbon sequestration out on the far right side. Because the state is considering being carbon sequestration in as a potential emissions reduction activity or measure. And so we are quantifying those um, in that event um, that that will, will happen. Okay, and I won't go into a lot of detail about the, what the emission reduction measures are. We don't, last time we talked about costs, talked about kinds of uh, policies that might need to come forward or that would need to come forward to target. These are the emission reduction measures that are needed to achieve the SC32 target or the full qualified target. Um, and again, it really revolves around electrifying buildings because again, we will have 100% renewable energy by 2030, not earlier, a very clean grid. 
We also focus in on the transportation measures. Um, see, we're bumping up active transportation by about five and a half uh, percent uh, for that load share. Active transportation, one percent. I'm going to circle back on that in a moment. Um, 35 percent, 25 percent passenger and commercial uh, electric vehicle uptake, uh, respectively, and a percent um, adoption of electrified off-road equipment, which is basically landscaping equipment, construction equipment. On water, and really don't need to focus in on wastewater. We're able to get our reductions to the target um, through building, transportation, and reductions in both organic and inorganic waste. So that's, those are the measures that are going to get us to that S32 target. But in order to go further, to go towards aspirational targets that we're recommending, in addition to going harder and stronger on the measures I showed you, exceeding those numbers that I showed you, we also have to set green economy actions, and we have 14 climate restoration actions that are specifically around carbon. You can see the, the green economy actions are really around businesses, um, did some vetting with, uh, we did a Chamber of Commerce and Business Council um, focus group um, and kind of worked through what are the priorities and how the wording appropriate on uh, actions. Uh, their highest priority is to uh, seek large-scale climate investments and partnerships on local and regional scales that help businesses with a just transition. But you can see there are a number of green economy actions um, that we are recommending. You can also see the final bullet green economy actions, which is perhaps less obvious from a business perspective, and that is leverage our community activation platform, which I'm going to show you a snapshot of at the end of this presentation. Um, leverage that platform and partners to encourage lifestyle choices for consumption-based emissions, including plant-based diets, travel alternatives, and local purchases, so buying local. Um, and we also want to explore policy options to increase adoption of plant-based and plant-strong diet. Um, so again, looking towards those aspirational purchases, these will work towards them, um, as well as a bit more aggressive on measures that I've already uh, presented. And, and again, we are going to need to be opportunistic. We're going to need flexibility to respond as technology new opportunities arise in order to make progress towards that <clears throat> Since I met you in January, we released over 100 draft actions. Again, those are the policies, the projects, the programs that will help us reach those measures and our target. And so we utilize a platform called Considerate. It's been open for over two months. We have 139 unique users that provided uh, not just their level of support for the 100 plus draft actions, but also able to have conversations and bring forward um, concerns or uh, support um, and really be able to articulate debate, have a public dialogue around action. Um, after the early priority deadline um, was finished on Considerate, pulled down all of the information, and we took a really close look at the actions that either had numerous comments, so see that there was a lot of dialogue going on, and those that showed lower level support. I will say that in general, all actions had fairly high level of support. In fact, none dipped below 50% support, which was kind of like our threshold to where we really needed to consider, okay, is this going to be something our community is going to be able to do? And we didn't have any that, that fell beyond, below that percent threshold. But for those where we had a lot of comments and we had um, lower rank, uh, ratings, we dove into them and looked at why. Um, and this is with the Climate Action Task Sustainability Team. And we did a little bit of uh, to address some of those comments. Many were around equity. Um, 
others want to push further. And so we are actually having some upcoming focus groups to hone in on two topics in particular, and that is public transportation and parking. Um, we have a lot of uh, discussion about actions that revolve around those two uh, topics. We heard from many community members that the 1% increase that we were uh, thinking that we could achieve um, around public transportation was insufficient, even recognizing that the city has limited levers because we don't own or control the metro. And so what we have said is let's have that. And let's bring all stakeholders together so we have um, Santa Cruz Equitable Public Transportation we have the Metro RTC, we have our, our board members um, from the Metro and the RTC, and a number of other stakeholders who are going to participate in this focus group on public It's important to remember, however, that whatever might come out of that for the parking uh, focus group is that we need to be sure that whatever's adopted for the fiscal qualified plan is achievable. And right now, the 1%, all of the Stakeholders um, from the RTC, Metro, and staff are in agreement that the 1% increase is truly what's achievable right now. Anything that might come out of those focus groups that goes further for us all to consider would go towards those that, that aspirational target, right? So we can we can aspire to, you know, beyond that one vote share increase, but we don't want it to be part of our qualified plan because we don't reach it. It could put us um, at legal risk. And so we want to make anything that comes out of this group be part of our aspirational uh, target. And so we have a lot more to come on this. We have uh, many, many more focus groups over the month of April. Um, we'll be doing about four different focus groups on building electrification uh, with different types of stakeholder groups. We have public health and housing going to be talking to as well as developers, labor, uh, designers. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> a, a number of uh, stakeholders building electric. And then we'll also be doing another focus group down in the class. And so using this considerate tool was a really good way for us kind of in a, in a organized way to collect comments. We did also receive some email comments that were also uh, considered when we were thinking through the revision to action. So that's the major engagement that's happened uh, since the last in front of you in January. Um, so moving forward from the draft actions, those are getting finalized right now. We are developing also concurrently the implementation and funding. So right now we are conducting interviews with all of our divisions within uh, departments who are relevant to this discussion. Um, we are talking to stakeholders and we are identifying roles. Is it an enforcement role, a compliance role, supportive, a leadership role, or our monitor role? Um, so we're assigning roles, different departments, divisions, and partners. Um, and I should say that really important to see this little quote on, on the right hand side. Everyone in the community, all departments, we all have a role to play in this plan's implementation. That's really important for folks to remember. And we're trying to put in place an implementation plan, accountability mechanisms, and activation tools to help folks to be part of that implementation. Um, and you can see here, we're identifying systems, tools, resources, what capacity is internally, what about funding, trying to problem solve the largest obstacles or risks that we're asking the part to identify. We're trying to um, put in place equitable, efficient, effective processes, as well as the funding plan. And lastly, we would like to tie the outcome to our health community well indicator metrics council adopted uh, in November of last year. Again, trying to weave health small policy everything we do and have alignment um, across our So our approach to the funding plan, this is um, one table that really going to constitute um, our approach, how we are going to fund this plan, which I told you last time 
community-wide is approaching a $1 billion implementation cost over the next eight years. What we are doing with our consultants right now is for the key measures and actions, so those are going to be primarily around transportation, where our biggest um, emissions sources are, as well as building electrification. We're going to be um, developing, we're doing this right now, the funding and the financing that is available. We know that not all the funding is going to come from grants alone. We need to leverage philanthropy. We need to leverage potentially new revenue streams, which are called out for evaluation in the plan and the actions itself. Um, and then we want to really target in on what is the top funding or finance pathway for the particular action and measure and give very solid examples of other organizations that have utilized similar funding mechanisms so that we have both cost to cost. Um, you see in the box on the lower left-hand side, there are already resources that are being put in place right now to help us with this endeavor. Um, all the jurisdictions, not all, but many jurisdictions in the Monterey Bay area recently contributed and pooled funds together that are being going to be held by the uh, Community Foundation as a fiscal sponsor to hire a regional climate project development grant writer. This is because we recognize that we as the small cities of Santa Cruz likely will be unable to compete on the federal level for federal infrastructure funds. But go together as a region, it's more likely to share those funds. So I'm very proud and happy to say that the city has committed to this fiscal year, two more fiscal years of contributions to this regional climate project developer and grant writer and we have a target of bringing in $10 million in year one. Now, that's not all the city, that's the Monterey Bay region, on the climate priorities that we have. Very excited about this resource and this collaboration. We also are working internally as part of our grant management strategy to put some resources together for staff, to pursue grants, and to administer grants as well as put forward some training so that, you know, folks have understand what makes a competitive grant proposal and um, how to answer. So there's really a lot happening in this space right now regarding funding. And we know we are getting well percent for funding that is coming down to the federal government. And of course, the billions that are set aside um, from the state for climate. So, once the implementation and the funding plans are complete, we um, have already started the draft. Our Climate Action Task Force has worked with us to look at other plans and what we like, um, put together the table of contents. We will have a public new draft available for the entire month of June. This draft is very accessible. It will be 40 pages, not going to be some long length no jargon kind of plan. It's going to have rich infographics, have layperson language, really highlight you know, what we need to do and what we've committed to doing. We have a number of technical memorandums that back up this 40 page plan. And if folks want to go and reference that, they can go do the deep dive. We, we will make those available for everyone. But we want to make sure that this plan is accessible, people will read it and that they will embrace it. And we plan to use an online platform. You can see here it's called Convio to, um, for that public where everyone can see what everyone else is saying and it organizes comments, questions, um, and so forth for us so that it allows us to pull that information offline to very quickly address comments and questions. So um, we're not 100% set that we're going to use this platform, but I, I think that we'll probably go to that. Um, in addition to the draft, um, and I'll give you the timeline on the adoption plan, we also have a task being developed that's specifically for tracking and reporting. Instead of me going to all the departments and for the data and then conditioning the data spreadsheet and then making graphs itself. This tool, we will give access to this for collecting data. They will enter it here. 
and it gives us a very robust platform to track reduction, our progress towards our target, and um, we can filter it in a variety of ways by departments, by individual measures, and so forth. So this tool is going to be very important. It also has a public uh, view that will serve as a sustainability dashboard for how close are we towards our target. We know that we can provide that feedback to the community and it can be embedded in our website. We have to go somewhere else so folks can see that. So we'll be developing that in a couple months while folks are reviewing the draft plan. And we will also be developing our community activation platform that will launch in September. Um, we have put into the climate action budget a little bit of funding to be able to launch this platform. And again, we are getting um, at a reduced price because we, as a Monterey Bay region, have vetted all the various gases platforms out there and come to the conclusion that we should all adopt platform for consistency. And so we are, the county, Watsonville, and others are doing so. It's called Bright Action, and it will um, allow folks to go and say, what are Santa Cruz's climate action goals? How can I get involved? What can I commit to? Can I join a team? Oh, there's incentives. Oh, there's teams. What's great also is that College Action is going to put staff to this school to recruit people to it, do the social media, which is the stuff that we don't have the bandwidth really to do. And so together, again, going together as a region really is what has unlocked our ability to launch a platform like this. And frankly, this is, I mean, in the past, I've got like 10 best things you can do for climate. You know, it's just like a fact. And it's so much more robust for folks. And it's really something I think our community is craving. Um, so very excited about the launch of Bright Action. And last round things out, I want to share with you the timeline to completion. We are nearing the finish line here. Uh, after today, we've got really cool youth digital storytelling pieces. There are environmental justice pieces featuring local youth and youth university students that are coming out. Um, at the end of this week, we're actually submitting to an EPA uh, challenge, a climate justice video challenge, uh, some of those, and that's our um, Civic Park fellow who's been working on those, who's funded by the Coastal Conservancy, uh, working with us. We also are having um, education, a learning webinar on heat pumps, which is the primary technology that enables building electrification. Um, one of our local companies here won a grant from Central Coast Community Energy, it's called Lumina, to develop a tool, very easy tool, where homeowners can enter a few things and they see, okay, what are the costs, what's the break even, what's my return on investment, in very accessible kind of ways. So we're going to be uh, co-hosting that webinar on the 13th. We're also going to use it as an opportunity to collect more information for our building electrification roadmap that we're developing currently climate action plan. In May, we're going to be visiting a couple of commissions. We're going to make that public review draft available for folks to you know, provide their comments on the draft. We will be wrapping everything up and going to uh, planning commission on July 7th and bringing the plan, the final plan, uh, to council August. Um, one thing that's not mentioned here is there is a CEQA checklist that's being developed to guide um, that CEQA threshold piece. Um, and then there's the full quantification of the emissions reduction. That's all part of the plan itself. That is my update for you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have um, on the Climate Action Plan status. Thank you. Thank you so much to Eli's West. That was, you squeezed it all in. <laughs> Very informative. Um, Let's see. Does uh, Council Member Golder have a question for? Yeah, I just yeah, quick question. But I also want to thank you, um, Tiffany, for all that um, great presentation. I especially like how you were saying visible, reasonable, 
and achievable because sometimes we have big goals and they're not, uh, you know, don't meet goals. Um, specifications, it's better to put them as stretch goals. I did have one, it's kind of a random question. Um, so with moving towards building electrification, and I know the governor has made a policy about gas, gas uh, generators and um, been some gas powered tools. I don't know all the details I have to say, but one question is um, my husband was saying that in San Jose, they're doing a similar thing and they're converting all the fire stations to electric stoves from gas. And um, they have some things that they need that, that they would need a backup generator, generator and they're running into red tape that he works for in, um, in getting a gas generator to run some things that they will need in the event of a power outage and for, you know, emergency operations. And so I'm wondering, there's like, you know, flexibility within our plan to, that, to understand that some of our necessary, you know, like obviously like some things need generator backup and it might have to be gas powered. And so I'm wondering if there's that in the plan somewhere. It definitely is, and it's funny that you bring that up because I was just talking about this very issue with fire department today with our internal meeting. So, yes, there we have, although we need to express where we can, we have added in language, um, you know, where feasible in many cases. With that said, and, and a really great piece of feedback that, that fire brought back to us is, well, can you lay out for us state of technology right now and then where you're anticipating it will going go and when so it'll give us an idea of when we need to make these changes and that was a brilliant gotta give uh, Paul Horvat credit for that that was a brilliant thought and so we're going to do that it's not difficult to do it we've done it already for a couple of the measures but not all of them so yes um, you know that right now cost there for um, solar battery storage to act solely uh, place like a diesel or natural gas gen set. And so, you know, we need to be mindful of when that's ready and we can bring it online. Now, also, the fire department has indicated that the fire admin building would be a great pilot test for that kind of technology where it would, you know, there, it's not, it's, uh, you know, doesn't have the kind of emergency load that they have fires. So great question. Yes, there's flexibility in our plan, but I, I don't want to take away from the fact that we do need to push um, also. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome to the question. Council Member Kelly Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Bruner, and thanks so much, Tiffany, for the presentation and all of the work. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, I was going to ask about youth engagement, and you and you shared a little bit about the the youth stories, the digital stories. I'm really glad to hear that. I wonder if there's anything more you can share on focus groups and whatnot that you've done with youth groups. I know you've done that in the past. Um, anything in recent months? Uh, so I'll just ask all my questions if that's okay. There's not that many. Um, and then um, in terms of the draft plan review. If you could just share a little bit how we will accommodate for Spanish speakers who will have that do that review and how we'll outreach to Spanish speakers and um, what are your thoughts on sort of digital access difficulty and how we can kind of accommodate that. Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Number one, with engagement. As you mentioned, we had done uh, three focus groups with youth up through January of this year. Since that time, we have continued to participate in our monthly climate action task force meetings as advisors. Um, also, anything else I was going to, oh yes, we have also um, uh, participated in both uh, city school district green schools committee as well, so that happens only three times a year. So we've done that, I think, twice in January. And then um, also the County Office of Education has, um, they call it Greenlit, and that's a monthly meeting, and we've been participating in that as well. Um, and there are lots of you get um, time slots to be able to present and ask questions. It's not a full hour. Um, 
And then last, want to do one more focus group with UCS, both youth, but also staff. Um, we've done, I've, I've done some um, class where I've uh, co-taught classes and kind of used that as a focus group, but we're seeing that we need to kind of have one more and get that staff engagement especially. So we're gonna do one more there. So that's youth engagement. Um, number two, the plan for Spanish are translate that 40 page document. And because it will be very accessible language and not a bunch of technical jargon, um, it will be accessible to folks. As I mentioned, we're also doing a focus group in the beach flat next month, which is gonna be super important because really that's, you know, we made available considerate Spanish and we didn't have anybody do it, right? People don't necessarily come to the website to review stuff, especially and so it's really important that we have those one-on-one -on -one touch points in the community, this focus group that we're gonna be doing, and we're gonna structure it so that it is like a draft and review without having a budget. So that, that's um, our, our um, on the side of um, And then on digital access, you actually have brought up something um, that I haven't given a lot of thought to quite frankly. So thank you for raising that. And I will need to get back. I'd like to talk to our equity consultant, our outreach engagement consultant about what that might look like. It hasn't come up quite yet. So if you all have any questions on that particular, I'd be happy to, to hear those also. Great. Thank you. I mean, I'm super excited for the interactive dashboard, but I know some people, that's a barrier. So thank you so much, Tiffany. Appreciate all the work. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor and Tiffany, for the updates and all of your work of going into this really, really comprehensive and um, ambitious plan. I um, so just uh, I have a question, but before I go uh, ask it, I would say you know, I think about ways uh, for increasing accessibility and. Just having recently talked with folks at the Nueva Vista Center and others in the beach area, it, it seems like they have some capacity, and I don't want to just offer up our community partners to participate in this, but um, they they have capacity to facilitate, like I know with the rental assistance, uh, COVID rental assistance, um, other programs, they provide that, and so they have uh, technology available, and they also have people facilitate that. So, in like a session where the dashboard together and may maybe make it a you know an event. I know youth in the Nueva Vista program have uh, many many wonderful ideas. Um, so that could be a way to try to increase that uh, engagement. My question is uh, a big question related to the, the forecasting around where we where we believe the state is going in uh, a couple of the uh, interagency boards I'm on the trans regional transportation and the Monterey Bay Air Resources District come up our conversations around particular agenda items that and then just talk, talking with staff there is uh, a move at the state to get more aggressive but also perhaps take more control over decision making uh, as we're seeing for example with housing development and so and that presents some opportunities and also some challenges and so I just wanted to ask you while we have you here your thoughts on you know, what that land looks like what you're anticipating I know there's likely to be more funding but also potentially uh, you know, some things that we'll have to then figure out how to manage, not necessarily, not unfunded mandates as well, potentially. So just wondering what your thoughts are about how that's gonna intersect with our work. Thank you for that question, Council Member Brown. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the state has directed the Air Resources Board to look at that carbon neutrality target and bringing it down to 2035, which you know is a more aggressive target. Um, at the same time, there are a number of unfortunately unfunded mandates that are coming online for example, in 2024. Um, and this is something, uh, Council Member Brown, that may have come up at MBARD, um, the uh, sunset of gas-powered equipment, not, um, not being able to purchase them in California any longer, which, you know, really accelerates. We, I was not really anticipating that to come so soon. Um, and, you know, that pressure not just on our landscaping industry, but the city as a, as a whole and the Parks and Rec Department specifically. So yes, there is uh, there are mandates that are unfunded that are coming down the pike. At the same time, as I mentioned, there also is unprecedented funding, and it may not be exactly tied to each of the mandates that are coming out. In some cases, they are, and in some cases, they are not. Um, with that said, I've been involved in a number of the sessions with state, the governor's office of planning and research, um, and a number um, of other state agencies on how match up the mandate with the funding. How simplified I've really been advocating for is simplifying and providing applications for grants across the state organizations and reporting requirements. Very onerous and arduous. It differs by agency. So with all of that said, it does appear that the state recognizes that there's a lot of work to do to kind of shore up funding and also the capacity constraints that we all have. Um, and, and in terms of control over banking, I'm not 100% sure what you're referencing here necessarily. Perhaps it is the unfunded mandate. Um, but we continue to stay uh, involved in state legislation. Um, our lobbyists rely on this kind of stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I can answer your question about how exactly that plays out in our climate action plan implementation, but we have called out um, continuing our engagement with our lobbyists and keeping a pulse and providing comments on state legislation and um, uh, state uh, grant funding opportunities as they develop. So I'm not sure if that gets to your question 100%, and if not, I'm happy to kind of check into this a little bit more. So, no, thank you. It's helpful. I um, Some of this Things that are we're hearing about may be coming, and so I don't really have uh, you know, a, a, a particular set, of, you know, concrete I'm asking about. So that was really helpful, and I will touch with as more specific come up. Get your take. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Please do. MBAR continue to be a key funder for us, as you all know. They funded the electric uh, refuse truck dumpster coming up, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot coming from uh, MBARD, so key part. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Have Council Member coming. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Tiffany, for um, all the work you've been doing over the, these years, um, having been on the Climate Action Task Force, you know, going to those meetings and seeing all the engagement you know it's a long time coming and we're getting close to the finish line so thanks for all the work that you do and especially the attention you've given to community engagement in this process um one question i had given kind of where we're at is uh the first is around kind of like space and opportunity for new community ideas and how we can incorporate that as we're moving forward so for example i know some people have um purchased um, like water heaters for their homes that are, um, you know, more efficient and some of the things that they've said is, you know, is there a way that the city can help subsidize these, you know, more efficient water heaters so that one, we're moving away from gas water heaters, two, you know, these are energy efficient water heaters. And so, you know, trying to see where there's subsidies for new technology. And then the second question is um, kind of opportunities to work with CSC. Um, for example, um, with pilot new technology, like there are folks in the engineering department and across many departments where they're coming up with new innovative ways for us to think about like microgrids and you know other sorts of technologies that really can help us kind of move on this path of 
coming up with new ways to conserve energy and reduce our carbon footprint. And, you know, the relationship with, between UCSC and the city kind of ebbs and flows in different ways, but, you know, there might be opportunities for us to, you know, work with labs on campus and use, for example, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, one of the um, fire department's office buildings as a way of, you know, incorporating new technology and seeing what could work. So I'm just wondering on those two fronts, like, summarize all that is you know, what opportunities are there for new community ideas and also what opportunities are there for us to partner with the university to kind of pilot new technology? Absolutely. Thank you for those questions, Member Cummings. So first of all, on the building electrification piece, um, in addition to the four focus groups that we're going to be holding over April and May that, of course, will we, we are counting it as engagement to inform our climate action plan, but really it's going to be informing the more detailed um, existing building uh, electrification roadmap. So we have those four focus groups coming up, and that's just phase one of our engagement to inform the roadmap itself. Our intention is to bring a, just a draft roadmap to council as a check-in point um, in September, and then as we identify the near-term policies that we want to put in place, we are going to develop an entirely new engagement strategy around that as well. So there's a lot of engagement coming on building electrification, and we know that we need the rebate to make this happen. Um, and we do have rebates that exist right now for state um, electric water heaters, like you mentioned. There are other technologies, and there are other opportunities for rebates through Air District through Central Coast Community Energy and so forth. So we, you know, we're we're providing feedback on that. In terms of um, opportunities to work with UCSC, um, we do have called out in the past a number of actions specifically around um, kelp farming, um, energy, um, and a couple other. And um, I think you know that I work pretty tight with UCSC on a lot of different stuff. So that is not just an important way to give students and researchers real world experience, but it actually expands our program capacity. And so to me, it's a win-win. I'm always looking for those opportunities. And I think we've got that covered in the plan. But I lastly want to pick up on kind of introduce your question. You said, you know, where's space opportunity for new community ideas moving forward? And that really resonated. And as we're developing this implementation plan, where you know we're foreseeing a, an annual update like we typically do, what we haven't done in the past is kind of give that space on a regular basis once the plan's adopted. And so I'd really like to consider that part of our plan. Maybe it's a community discussion, or maybe a couple community discussions leading up to that update. That would also be the opportunity collect implementation feedback from the community itself, not support it from a perspective. So thank you for the questions and for kind of repeating that idea. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, okay, at this point, I will uh, bring it out for public comment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The item that we are on is Climate Action Plan 2030. You can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement you've unmuted, and the timer will then be set. So I will go out to the attendees, and the first hand raised is the name I am watching. Yeah, hi. Uh, even the IPCC admits this is of lesser priority than a great many issues facing humanity. Never forget, the number one concern is always the human condition 
and it has been the exploitation of cheap energy with the Western values of liberty and capitalism that have done the heavy lifting and producing the continuous benefit to the highest priorities, which are always poverty elimination, adequate food, medicine, et cetera, and to the massive betterment of the human condition in many other countless ways. Let's not screw that up. California has the toughest emissions targets to achieve in the world. Question those who would make them even tougher, then question them again. Climate change is a total win-win proposition for every politician justifying no limit, save the world mandates without any possibility or necessity or even well, of proving that any of their extreme actions taken actually will achieve any global uh, control uh, or even help more than harm. I would remind, because it takes decades to actually evaluate the climate. I, I would remain uh, remind after decades of trying to go renewable, Fossil fuel still represents 84% of all the world's energy use and 97% of transportation. It's not because of a lack of trying. It's just not that easy. And issuing totalitarian mandates of huge CO2 reductions to be done in just eight years is very risky in itself. The same people who want to go full green will not allow the like thousand percent more mining of the materials needed to massively build out green infrastructure. And they're not too fond of nuclear power either. Future energy needs will also be far greater. They always are, not less. Of all the adopted leftist agendas, sustainability has long-term legitimacy, but it is too important to be hijacked by the likes of leftist AOC, Bernie, the New World Order globalists, et cetera, getting the greatly uh, enlarged maximum inflammatory and justice emergency movement and the maximum predictions of doom and hysterical fear-mongering. Please, no hijacking to support or other leftist dogma issues. The moronic phrase climate justice is a tell here. Those who actually care nothing about individual rights, our constitution, practicality, and the collateral damage to the human condition instead have their false claims of injustice and virtuosity powering their central authority mandates to greed, the acquisition of power and control in mind. Scientific grants aren't awarded for claiming non-emergence. They're heading uh, by progressives like the scrunched uh, Hitler-like angry face pal Greta Thunberg, or AOC, the barista turned dangerous anarchist simpleton progressive congresswoman, really alarms me. There is serious scientific opinion against the notion that the science is settled as to the certainty that a save the world critical emergency exists, absolutely requiring such rapid, radical, risky mandate action in just the next eight years. Lots of lies exist, and the narrative is muddy. Uh, note the desire to mount a massive propaganda effort. Lastly, and um, I can't be too offended, but this is how it feels. The stomach turner is the type simply cannot keep their hands off of children. Similar to the indoctrination, not education, teaching of six and seven year olds about various sex options, they always seek to indoctrinate the vulnerable to their narrative as early as they can. It's a kind of fifth column pedophilia. Keep the Girl Scouts and religion out of it. If actions were sane, rationally derived to uh, well through thought, obviously to the human good uh, from any type of ideas, propaganda, fear-mongering, and even legislation wouldn't be needed to gain support. Consider getting a lot more objective counseling. Make sure your priorities, your scope, actual abilities, and consent are uh, considered. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, one more. Name is Colleen Steele. Go ahead and unmute yourself, and it's your turn for public comment. Um, it's an interesting diatribe to follow. Um, I'd like to say thank you, Tiffany, and Justin, and Sandy, and especially because you've been more at the forefront of the climate change. Thank everybody on the council. Uh, the goal of zero emissions by 35. I applaud that. Uh, my group has been pushing for 2030 for a long time, but that would have been incredibly difficult. And uh, hopefully this will all work. Uh, there is a lot to be done, but that's been acknowledged. I like the choice of the Bright Horizons platform because working with other cities and with Ecology Action makes a lot of sense. Um, so, I, as you know, I'm part of the Climate Action Task Force. I heard several new things today, several things I've heard before, but the new things are all good. Thank you.
you for your comment. And there, if there are any other members of the public who would like to comment on our agenda item today, Climate Action Plan 2030, please raise your hand by dialing star nine. And I see the name Kyle Kelly. Hey, all this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wisewes, for the presentation and the climate action plan. Uh, it's been really great to see that coming together. Um, I, I do I do want us to keep pushing on transportation and land use. Climate scientists, Berkeley, overall know that they basically outlined like we can change our cities to, to meet what we need and actually reduce our biggest source of emissions, which is from transportation. Um, that means bringing people back into the city, um, you know, allowing the 30,000 commuters that come here to actually live in the city. Um, and I, and it is a basically the policy to actually change and allow for more people to live within the city. Um, un unlike everything else that we do for fleets and waiting to electrify all cars within, within the city and hoping that we're going to solve traffic while also in the car. So I would love now get to a walkable, bikeable community um, that connects us with the train back to the rest of the state. Um, so, anyway, I just want to say uh, big support. Thank you, thank you, staff, so much. Here's to here's to getting climate action done. Thank you for your comment. There are other attendees. Now is the time to call in. Don't see any other hands raised. Okay. So at this time, I will close the comment and bring it back to council to provide feedback. And this, since this is a an item to review the climate action plan and um, no action is being uh, recommended at this time. It was more an update. Um, I do want to thank you, Wise West, uh, for highlighting the most equitable path to carbon neutrality and the partnership and the work that's been done since our January 8th. 18th meeting, I believe it was, uh, mid-January. Um, and so our next step, or your next step, there, there will be a webinar on um, pump education and four focus groups, different categories, um, and how would members of the public uh, get information if they were interested in a focus group? Thank you for that question, Mayor. Um, we'll be providing that on our website and we will be doing targeted outreach. We have, believe it or not, almost a thousand people um, contact list um, and we have them categorized by different interest groups. And so we'll be doing direct outreach um, also. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Boulder, do you have any feedback? Any wise left? Okay. Uh, Council Member Brown, that thumbs up, two thumbs up. Council Member Kalantari Johnson, Council Member Cummings. Just, I think the one thing I might add is that um, to um, Seal's point that she brought up, you know, there's a number of folks in the community who would really like to see, you know, like to see a more aggressive plan. I think it would be great for us just to. Um, you know, have planned, and I know this is something that's happening, but just remind the community that we will be providing them with updates on kind of where we're at with our goals, just so that if we're, you know, if we're actually moving more quickly than we anticipated, making sure that we're letting the public know that we're, um, you know, on track or we're off track and, you know, what we can do to help improve that and just continue to keep everybody updated on the efforts that, that we're making to really take this seriously and try to meet our goals and actually go above and beyond our goals. Would that be seen in the cap dash um, tool that you um, spoke about? 
Yes, Mayor, um, folks can always go on their own time to tap dash to see where things are at. Um, but then we also will be doing um, that annual update to council. And I like the idea of having kind of a two-way feedback mechanism in advance of considering that. So um, I think we'll have a couple of different ways for folks to do it on their own time or to participate more formally. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, that does conclude this study session. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And this meeting is now adjourned. We will return at 4.30 for our special meeting on uh, our district map. I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly, is here and available. Sir, would you mind turning on your camera? Or uh, announcing that you are here. There we go. Hello, City Council members. Yes, I'm here. Y estoy a la orden para cualquiera que necesita ayuda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and Peter, I will be giving instructions on how to call in, and if you could relay that as well, that would be great. Uh, okay, so if you wish to comment on an agenda item today, you'll need to call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on the screen. Are the instructions in Spanish on the screen? No. They're not. So um, <clears throat> we will need to make sure we we can um, get that information out. Mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming. So if you need to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to when it's time for public comment, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. Here, Bishir, is there any of those instructions you'd like to relay in Spanish? Sure. Um, para los que quieren comentar en español, lo que tienen que hacer es vean en su pantalla primero eh, dejen el teléfono en modo silenciador o el, lo están haciendo en un computador que el, déjenlo en el modo silencio, silenciador silenciado y una vez que usted que ya empieza a, a empezar la sesión está usted pendiente mandando el, eh, marcando el, el número que está en la pantalla y después de eso usted presione una vez que una vez vea el número que aparece en la pantalla márquenlo y después pongan asterisco nueve para poder ustedes levantar la mano para que les ponga la atención y después de ahí le van a decir cuando usted pueden hablar y después de eso ya con el asterisco 6 van a poder hablar otra vez. I would now like to ask her, please call roll. Member Kalantari Johnson. Present. Here. Brown? Here. 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 Mayor Watkins? Here. Present. Thank you. Our first agenda item this afternoon is public hearings, receive input, 
from the community regarding the selection of a district map and election sequence. For members of the public for streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to council. There is there a, a need to translate that? I think we're good right now. Yeah, you let me know as well. Uh, stop at any point or repeat anything. So at this point, I would like to hand it over to uh, Casey Simard, I hear, uh, for our staff presentation. Thank you, Mayor Brunner. Thank you, Mayor Brunner. And actually, I'm going to immediately turn it over to the city's demographer, Dr. Doug Johnson, National Demographic Corporation, to uh, do a presentation. Thank you. And Mayor, members of council and the public, it is a, a pleasure to be with you again. Um, I'm going to share my screen and walk through a presentation. So as you recall, um, had two prior hearings that were an introduction to this issue and an introduction to the rules and demographics of the city and the idea of the change. So I'm gonna review that a little bit. Really today's uh, discussion is, a, is about the first set of draft maps. And I do want to emphasize these are the first set of draft maps. It's not final. They are certainly open to revision, to new options, new maps. But the, the goal of these maps is really get the discussion. And as noted on the agenda, we are starting with the six districts options, and then there'll be a later item on seven districts. And I'll come back to the thing behind that. That, let me jump in. First of all, um, for those that didn't listen in on the uh, earlier hearing, and um, I do wanna remind folks, we are looking at a change in how the council is elected. So right now we have what are called at-large elections by election. Everyone runs for however many are up, the top vote getters are elected. Um, if people do some research on this, they may come across what's called from district or residence district. That's where elections are citywide, but the candidates have to live in a certain district. There, I think we're only down to two or three cities left. Um, in part because under the California Voting Rights Act, those are treated the same as an at-large election with no protection uh, from that system. The only safe harbor uh, under the California Voting Rights Act, where um, plaintiffs are not allowed to bring litigation against the city is by district election, um, either an entirely by district system or uh, districts uh, citywide election. Both are, are safe harbors. So that's what we're looking at. This whole process is all about the city transitioning from citywide at large elections by district elections where Candidates will need to live in the district they want to represent, and only the residents of that district will vote in that election. This is an extensive process. The city has been doing a lot of discussion and outreach and, and uh, meetings on this topic. We did start back in August, September with initial hearings. Um, as I mentioned, to introduce the issue, those did not have draft maps in them. Uh, we actually received the census data from the federal government in August, and then California actually adjusted that data to um, move the state prison population, prison location, to the last known home addresses. So we really get that the official data for this process at the end of September. So uh, we did uh, work on draft maps, which have been posted to the project website for quite a while now. And then this is the first of two hearings today and the next one is currently scheduled for April 19th to talk about these maps and like it to reaffirm what I said this is just the initial set of maps certainly open to direction and request bring those maps post those maps a week before the next hearing currently scheduled 
after these hearings and after the council selects um, their preferred map, uh, there will be the, the ballot measure. I believe it's going to go on the June 7th ballot uh, where voters will be asked to, to um, decide whether they prefer a seven district um, system where the mayor rotates among the council or six districts the citywide elected mayor. And then the city will have its first election uh, by district, the first set of districts this November. I'll come back to that issue of seeking the plan uh, later on. We want to hit the, the reason for scheduling the two hearings today, one on six, six districts and one on seven, is that as everyone knows, currently there are seven council members of the rotating mayor. Um, and thus that's the um, the next hearing that we'll get into is the options that they would draw maps that fit in the current system. And the council has, has voted to put a measure on the ballot, which the six district. The key thing for today is emphasize that the reason we split them is that we're looking today to start the process of deciding on the best six district map and to decide on the best seven district. Um, the debate on whether six or seven is better is really uh, better held in the context of that ballot measure. That's not the goal of this tonight. Why they're listed as separate. You will come out of this process uh, with two maps a preferred six district map, preferred seven district maps. We really want to get good input specifics of the maps rather than six. So with that introduction, I'm going to jump into the rules and, and of uh, how lines get drawn. Uh, there are really three categories of, of rules and goals in the process. The first, uh, the left of your screen is federal laws, the requirements you have to do uh, under federal law. Number one here is equal population. And this is a tough one. It is very, very strict that using 2020 census data as adjusted by the state of California, you have to have almost exactly the same number of total people in each district. There's a couple of percentage uh, plus or minus margin um, to avoid splitting a neighborhood and that kind of thing, but it really is a very strict uh, requirement. One of the questions that's come or comments that's come up a lot in the uh, extensive input you've already received is, you know, why is this air neighborhood combined with that neighborhood, or why does this line line end up here? Almost always, when those lines end up in a place that doesn't isn't a natural neighborhood boundary, it's because of the equal population requirement. A neighborhood that's trying to be kept together is big, to be a district by itself, or it's too and has to be. So when folks are looking at the maps, they always need to remind that equal population requirement that taking something out of a draft map, of one district in a draft map, also means you have to put some other people into that district from somewhere else so that we can get equal population. So that's a lot of information. I won't go into that much detail on the other criteria, but I did want to emphasize that since it does, it is the explanation for a lot of the questions. Uh, outreach effort so far. Other federal laws are, you have to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. And in the context of, of Santa Cruz, that really means um, keeping the, the uh, beach flats area united and together. It's not large enough to be a district all by itself. And the Latino and, and African American and Native American and Asian American that in the city are not large enough to be majority district, majority of a district. We're not looking But under the law, we do need lots area neighborhood in one. I'll show you a map. And at the same time, no racial gerrymandering. So race can be a consideration, but it cannot be the what the law calls the predominant why a map. You're not supposed to choose a map because it has a 28% district where, uh, say, 20% Latino, where another district. Uh, it's all about neighbor. Or number. Those are federal laws. The state has new rules. These just took effect in 2020 called the Fair Maps Act. It's the middle column and it says num and these are prioritized. Number one, districts have to be contiguous. They can only cross water where there's a road or a, or a bridge or a ferry. 
into the law. Um, number two, the um, district should, to the degree possible, avoid dividing neighborhoods or what the law calls communities of interest. And that's an area that has a shared interest, either demographically, socially, or in terms of city policy. That when that community benefits from being kept in one district. Number three, the district should follow easily identifiable boundaries, such as streets, rivers, major streets, rivers, and like that. And number four, the district should be compact. State defines as not bypassing one group of people to get to a more distant. The state also bans uh, districts being drawn or a map being picked in a way that favors or discriminates against the political party. That one's pretty easy. Just don't have political data in our database. We're not looking at partisan data process. So those are the requirements. We have federal requirements. We have state requirements. We have multiple maps that meet all those requirements. Then courts have uh, approved a set of traditional principles. These are goals. They're not requirements. A few things, and some of these are only apply to redistricting or on, but um, when you're redistricting, you can try to minimize the number of voters election years. That doesn't come in now because when you're districting time, everyone voted. One that does factor in at this phase is you can um, be possible after you meet all the statutory requirements, you can respect the voters' choices in terms of trying to avoid putting council members together. The idea here is let the voters decide which council members have earned re-election rather than uh, the lines dictating that Okay, voters, you cannot reelect this person. Again, this is a goal, it's not a requirement. You can also consider future population growth um, within the population margins I mentioned earlier. So you can't consider it a lot, but a couple percentage plus. Then the other one that will come up next time when you are redistricting after the 30 census is you can try to keep the core of existing districts together. So the people who have worked together on the past campaign for a given district continue to work together and don't get divided up. This is why this first time through process is so important because you are setting up the districts that while they will be revised every 10 years, these districts will be the core basis that those revisions are made on. So that's a, a lot of rules. It is a complicated process. There are a lot of things to be balanced, but we've already seen community uh, feedback in the city that people are wrapping their heads around it and giving us very good mentioned uh, the federal voter rights act and the geographic concentration um, this map the, the blues and purples are very low those are, are less than 25 to 35 percent of the city block only dark blue and purple um, the city blocks that are yellow green and red are where let's for majority of the population. Most city blocks only have a few people, so the scatterings of and uh, reds don't really impact the demographics of the district. But you can see down in the beach flats, we have a neighborhood that has a higher, much higher concentration than uh, our condels. That's why I talk about that neighborhood. Similarly, as you, as you may recall from the past presentations, there's not nearly as many African Americans in that area, but there is a more of a concentration of African than elsewhere in. There. And the other uh, protected class population that does have significant numbers in the city, Asian Americans, and they are concentrated to the degree that. So that's our really our voting rights uh, act. Um, for those of you that have looked at all the demographics we put out about all the maps, know that we look at a lot of data, renters, um, education levels, age levels, so we can generate maps such as this one of, of the percentage of renters in this area. Um, you can see the data is not city block by city block, it's more small neighborhood or what the census calls block group. But it is somewhat handy if, if folks are interested in looking for how many districts have a majority of residents for renters? They can get that kind of data off, um, off this demographic sheet. And actually all of the data that's shown in those sheets is also available in the online mapping. 
So with that, now we'll jump into the maps. And I'll go through these really quickly, um, but I'm happy to come back in more detail. And hopefully folks have taken the time uh, over the past few weeks and we've posted to look at them in more detail. Um, well, I'm showing them in static images on this map. Um, on the city website and linked on here is a what we call an interactive review map. And if there are detailed questions, I'll jump to that. But if that lets us zoom in, you can enter an address, you can switch over to satellite view, all kinds of detail about each. But I'll start off with uh, 601. There are three maps all together that have 601. 601 is a highly compact district. Um, really, you get regional squares. Yeah. Um, with a, a north uh, northeastern district one really around on both sides of the of the freeway. Uh, then South Water Street in District Two, both of which are bordered by the river. Nice, uh, easily recognizable boundary. Um, there's a little bit more population east side of the river than is needed to make two districts. So District Four picks up that last bit actually below Beach Street, and then com comes over, gets the pier and, and in the air up to Mission. And goes over to Bay Street. You can see District 6 then is the, the, the west side. Three and five um, are up above Mission Street, Coast Road and up. 602 um, gets, uh, Four district down to the, the ocean front. Um, this does have the result. A couple of commenters noticed this, which I was happy to see. District three has what looks like an odd extension going west. I uh, see down where it says Woodrow Avenue. Each there actually is green in part of district. The only reason for that is that we have to follow census plot, which is the geography that gives us the uh, population. Divide them up, then we don't have official population. What the Census Bureau drew is one giant census block that goes from where it says West Cliff Drive all the way down and around. So there's no conscious policy choice saying District 3 should extend along the west of Columbia Street. That's just forced by the block yard. But you can see this is less of a, a square and blocky approach and more of a um, extend from the beach up road. Uh, so we do again get a, a district one in the northeast around the freeway. Um, get the uh, north of High Street, much more focused district five. Uh, district four in the really in the center of the city down to the down the street. I'm sorry, down to the beach. And then district three uh, taking the west side of Bay Street um, until we get down to. District 6 in this one does end up kind of an unusual combination. It's the west side of the city. Graphically, it looks pretty good, but as has been noted by a couple of commenters, it is a, a curious mix of different neighborhoods um, on that as it goes west side up towards the east. And then the last map to show you in this uh, six map set is um, 603, um, which is uh, just a, a slight changes from the original. So generally uh, close, but small, small tweaks. I do want to emphasize too, the goal of these maps is to show, get the discussion going. There's certainly revisions possible. Um, again, as long as we population. Adjusting for like maybe appropriate. The other thing just to touch on briefly is on the PDF maps that are posted to the project website, um, there is election sequencing. And now that these going to district elections, some of the districts will be up one election cycle. The first ones will be up in 2022. Other districts will be up in 2024. So once the council ultimately picks a six district map and a seven district map, it will need to also choose which ones are up in which year. This can be a very complicated calculation. Uh, so we tend to come back to this once we're down to final map or final map. Uh, 
but I'm happy to discuss it earlier if you wish. The one key thing to keep in mind is that there's no change, regardless of which map is chosen or where council members end up, there is no change to anyone's current district. I'm sorry, current term. All the current council members will serve the remainder of their current term, regardless of which map is chosen. These maps only pack council members once it's time to run for re-election. Council members find it. I'm happy to come back in more detail on that, but it, it can get very convoluted and hard to follow. If you have a bunch of maps like with that, the goal of this hearing is to talk about the six district maps, uh, see what residents and, and ultimately you, the council members, believe is the best map, and then, as I mentioned, get back on what should be changed in those maps before you come back for the next. Hearing. And then I do have this quick reference slide that I'm happy to put up um, if people want to see the maps side by side. These are the same maps, obviously, just uh, uh, side by side. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have now or after public comment. Thank you so much, Doug Johnson. Um, uh, we did receive questions from some constituents, um, and uh, one of the main uh, questions on this, the six district map, um, was the separation of the sprite area, and um, 602 seemed to keep that north south um, area, neighborhood, community of interest together. And the other two didn't. Were there other variations that um, you looked at with terms of all the requirements federally? And um, not yet, but that's exactly the kind of feedback we're looking for, which is to, to figure out which pieces of the maps make sense and which don't. And what we often come up with is you know, let's use the left hand side of this map and the right hand side of that map and NBC to figure out how to. Put those pieces together. So it's certainly uh, excellent feedback, and and uh, we, if there is a preference for one of the other maps, try to modify it, put C right together. And then um, after all the questions you received today from council members and members of the public, will you return with some answers at the next April public hearing, or do you hope to kind of? address some of those now in terms of map configuration? Um, in terms of questions about the maps and the rules, I definitely won't want to answer those now. In terms of drawing revised map, uh, we probably come back to those uh, well before the next hearing. We want to get those revised maps, look at them, uh, react to them, and come to the hearing. Prepared. And, and last question, do those revised maps have to be posted again seven days before the April hearing? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, I, I should note, too, that uh, if residents want, there is a link on the city website to try their own hand drawing maps as well. So we do certainly encourage that. Um, it, it takes a couple minutes to figure out how to do it, but once you figure it out, it's pretty straightforward. And there are some videos. Uh, Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings? I'm wondering for the purpose of discussion, if we can have the maps on the screen so that we can kind of look at them as we're having this conversation. Yeah. And then I guess um, I'm wondering, one of the questions I have is, so it's 601 and 603, I'm just thinking in terms of um kind of like demographic similarities and similarities within kind of neighborhood impacts and needs um like the ocean corridor shares a lot in common with uh the beach flats and i see that in 601 and 603 there's kind of like this downtown kind of beach area and then it extends kind of way over seabright and I'm just kind of, and I'm just curious about, you know, 
on why that's the case and whether there's um, any kind of way that the map could be drawn in such a way that you know, the downtown beach area and like lower ocean is one area and then the kind of sea bright area back because I think that also gets to kind of one of the, what we see in 602 which is um, Kind of see that Seabright's more intact, but then also just thinking about um, you know the beach air, or the the ocean corridor there being kind of kept within the downtown and flat kind of area. Yes, certainly. Um, as we think about taking areas out of certain districts and into other districts, there's a lot of flexibility. Challenges for each area we take out, we have to put some. But certainly, right now, like in 601, four and six really split waterfront uh, for the length of the city. Mm -hmm. That could be rotated. One of them could become entire, the entire waterfront. The other one then become kind of an inland uh, from the waterfront. So, Seabright by itself isn't big enough to be its own district all by itself, but certainly the lines could be readjusted to that neighborhood together with just has to be with something. But that could certainly be, that's the kind of thing we're happy to draw is what if there's just one coastal district that would be more of the somewhat inland coast areas. Uh, yeah, I think that would actually probably be even worse. Um, with my opinion, because there's different competing interests as you move along the coast from kind of more affluent, large homes on the west side to low income in the beach flat area, and then you get to more like, you know, vacation rentals in the Seabright area. But, um, but I guess that leads to another question with kind of, you know, what are some of the, I know population driver, and obviously like you can't split up beach flats neighborhood based on kind of what you said, but it also seems like when you look at demographic, like the beach, the ocean corridor has a higher, seems like has a higher population of Latinos versus other areas of the city. And that sounds like one of the drivers of not splitting up flats area. And so I guess part of what I'm interested in understanding is, you know, is there then a, is there a driver for keeping kind of that ocean to beach flats corridor intact? Um, and so instead of, for example, 602 kind of spreads that District 4 kind of north, east, but rather than that, having it spread a little bit further south, like in 601, not going into the Seabright area, but having it kind of squeeze into two and then having parts of one be corp incorporated into area two. So these are just, I guess this is less of a question and more of a suggestion of that, you know, when we think about populations of, renters and we're looking at demographic in terms of Latino population, like that corridor pretty um, heavily renter, I believe, um, of a single socioeconomic, of a similar socioeconomic class and demographic. So there might be, you know, the um, a reason for why we should keep that intact versus kind of taking four and shifting it over into Seabright area, and, which splits up Seabright then also um, really kind of breaks apart this continuous corridor that has similar interests. Certainly, yeah, I'd be happy to come up with a revision. You know, we really use the river as a long boundary in all three of these maps, but as you know, the, the demographics on the two sides of the river are not that different, especially as you get closer to the coast, so we can certainly uh, do a version that together thanks yeah and, and i guess I'll, the last comment i'll make is i say that because for example in the summer months ocean street has a lot of traffic that traffic all goes into the flat we're trying to get the boardwalk so those impacts are shared by the people who live within those areas and so keeping that as one district might be helpful so that whoever's representing that district have um a strong say given the impacts that those people face in those areas. And I guess there also could be the argument that we want more representative uh, 
that have a say over that corridor. But, you know, just putting that out there is something to think about. Those are my comments. Now. All right. Uh, let's see. Council Member Myers, do you have any questions before we go to public comment? Thank you, Mayor. I do not at this time. Thank you. Council Member Golder, questions? I don't have any questions. Um, I have a comment. Can I just say? My initial, I, I wasn't, I'm not prepared to make any decision about this, but after listening to the presentation and looking at them side by side and knowing like possibilities, for me, um, having lived in different neighborhoods, like the right side of 602 seems to make sense and the left side of 601 seems to make sense from like, you know, like neighborhoods. But that's just my initial, I'm definitely not prepared to make any decisions tonight. Thank you. Um, I would say that does align with some of the emails that I did in terms of um, 602, map 602 and map 601 uh, comments regarding districts that people felt were communities of interest. And if the left side and right side mesh together. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, you know, the only question I would maybe ask is if there's an opinion on it. Um, is there a benefit of having, sort of looking at 602, for example, on the left side, how it does kind of merge the different districts, so there is a little bit more of a spectrum of representation, and I'm just wondering if our demographer wants to speak to that at all. Sure. This is an a issue that comes up all the time. Um, and, and it's a very good question. There's no right or wrong answer. It's really a neighborhood by neighborhood question. So if there's, speaking generically, not for the comments that Santa Cruz, but if there's an area that, for example, has never elected, never been a council member from that area, um, that tends to be good to put that area together so that they can be heard and finally get elected. I don't know that that's really true here, um, but you would probably know that better than I would, certainly. Um, if there's an area that has always been fairly well spoken and, and you know, gets the vote out, has no problem getting the attention of council on their issues, they're probably better off being divided. So they still have two or even three council members who are directly accountable to the neighborhood. Obviously, each voter would vote for one, but if they have a neighborhood meeting, you'd have two or three council members. It dilutes their voting strength in terms of the odds of them electing someone from that neighborhood because they're split two or three. But if they're able to make their vote heard um, and get attention to their issues, they're probably better with more. That comes up most often with um, large, like Sun City retirement. Yeah. You know, when you have an off cycle April election and still turnout is 99%, you don't have to be united in the district to be heard. Um, so that's kind of the spec neighborhood by neighborhood you can decide. And it's certainly expected that certain communities benefit from being kept together and other communities benefit from not. In part because the key thing for everyone to remember, the council I'm sure has top mind, it still takes four votes to pass any. So it, so it is uh, having a consolidated district makes it possible to hear your voices heard, but being divided up here to, to get a policy adopted. That's helpful. Thank you. Council Member Brown, do you have any questions? Mayor, I, I have one question I wanted to ask now, and then I thought I'd reserve the rest of my question for after the public. Um, in terms of the, but since we're looking at the maps and I'm thinking about it, the, the city Division district requires that it's based on population, and there know that across the city there are different levels of turnout. Um, which I mean, and I understand that's a that's a factor in any election, but in district elections where some uh, districts end up having a, a much lower number of voters electing. Uh, 
their council member. And so I understand that there's imbalance there and it's not really much done, but I'm wondering if in your experience where districts are drawn, there have been where there is such a significant imbalance that it's, of, if any, nothing else, the district boundaries. So I'm just thinking about UCS and the fact that that district is going to have, no matter how it's drawn, but if it is all in one district, it's going to have a much lower voter turnout. Um, so just wondering how that's in your experience. Sure. So traditionally, this doesn't really apply to a university scenario you know, here, but traditionally, that's actually viewed as a, a benefit of district elections because traditionally it's you know, the historically poor, um, more heavily immigrant, generally low turnout neighborhood that benefits from going to districts because their turnout rate is low, their voice citywide, their, their voices get small. Now that they have a district, they can be heard and have a seat. Um, even though their turnout tends to stay relatively low. Um, so it, that that element tends to be viewed as a, a benefit. But you're exactly right. I don't think you'll see this kind of extremes in Santa Cruz, but you know, there are congressional districts, for example, where in our LA, members of Congress will get elected with 50 or 60,000 votes because there's so many immigrants they're not reached low. Whereas in say South Orange County, it takes 250. So though you get those disparities without a doubt, where it's driven by an area that hasn't been heard, that's a benefit. Where it's driven by um, the dynamic like a university, we also see with military bases, that that is also a challenge, not really a benefit. But we we have we have a couple of clients for military base size council district. And of course, not only are they almost all registered at their hometown, active duty military are barred by military code of justice from running for office. So we have to get very creative in order to find someone who can fill that. So it is a it is a challenge. Not a Council, okay, looks like that concludes council member questions at this time. So I will take it out to public comment. For members of the public who are interested in commenting on the selection of a six district map and election sequence, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar on your computer. When it is your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set to minutes. Can I translate that to Spanish? Yes, please. I was just looking for you. Um, we will have Peter Vichier translate to Spanish. Buenas tardes. Si ustedes quieren comentar ahorita sobre la discusión de los seis distritos de la ponencia que acabamos de escuchar, lo que usted tiene que hacer es que con su teléfono presione asterisco 9 para levantar su mano o si usted está en el computador, levante la mano con el icono de la mano. Gracias. Okay. First caller, phone number ending in 9642. Hi there. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to pass because I was having trouble with my computer, so I went on my phone. But now I'm back on the computer, and I have raised my hand. So I so I'd like to uh, talk using the computer. Okay. All 
Our next caller or member of the public with their hand raised is Catherine. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself or unmute on the webinar controls. Hi, welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. A um, couple of comments here. Um, I think that it's really important to, um, let's see, I'm looking at map 601, which I think is best for residents living on the west side because the other maps, um, uh, we as households will lose our vote to the UCSC block if we're included in the um, UCSC district. And so 601 is the best in that regard. And then my second thought is that I'm, I think it is important to keep the beach area and the downtown area, the two primary commercial districts, in as a as a combined interest. And whether that goes to Ocean Street, as had just been discussed, maybe that makes sense too. But I think it is important not to divide the beach area from downtown. And finally the point that was made earlier, keeping Seabright as a district is important. Um, so the, the right side of 602 looks good for Seabright, um, but it looks terrible for uh, households that would be swallowed by a UCSC. Um, that's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, your comment, our next, uh, hand raised is the name Rafa Sonnenfeld. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, my comment um, has to do with um, really the spirit of the um, district elections. You know, um, we're responding to um, a potential lawsuit alleging that we uh, have an inadequate process to ensure minority representation on the city council. And it seems to me like the best way for us to uh, ensure minority representation on city council would be to have as close to a minority as possible. Um, so I wanted to really echo the comments that um, council member Cummings made earlier about trying to um, connect uh, the Beach Flats area and the Ocean, uh, Ocean Street area uh, which or lower ocean area, which have a higher concentration of uh, Latino voter, um, in the hopes that, that you know we really uh, honor the spirit of of this redistricting process to try to ensure that we have um, Latino representation on our city council. So I hope that we get to see another map um, that tries to. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for your comment. Our next uh, member of the public is Vivian Vargas. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Um, so as a former uh, Latino Affairs Commissioner for the city of Santa Cruz back in 2011, when uh, district maps were being considered and the lawsuit happening, um, I was, of course, interested in Latino, Latinx representation. So when the proposed maps came out, I looked at both of them carefully. And what I kept seeing was that um, voter registration of, of, this, of the council districts in all of the maps uh, would not um, be able to form a, a majority. And then I learned of all of the reasons why the maps were written as they were. Um, and in Beach Flats, the, the voter registration for the Latinx community is 17%, uh, but for the non-Hispanic white community, it's 73%. So I became a bit frustrated um, seeing as how this is the way district maps are, and also the origins of the lawsuit were supposed to be Latino or Latinx representation. And then I remembered, or that I considered, 
uh, percentages is not destiny, as we can see by our own city council, uh, uh, racial uh, percentages from the census 2020 does not determine you know, uh, the representation of uh, council members on, on our city council. So what I feel is that looking at all of the maps, perhaps maybe to uh, answer the initial uh, uh, argument that was brought up, why we had to uh, ensure Latinx uh, representation, is maybe we need a comprehensive study on why there is no Latinx representation in the city of Santa Cruz. What are maybe systematic um, protocols or things that are in our city that not help support Latinx representation? And uh, so I think if we can spend the money and the time for a comprehensive plan to deal with homelessness, I think we can spend uh, time to uh, have an a, a investigation, have a, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a study into Latinx representation in the city of Santa Cruz, especially since we're talking of over 12,600 persons who are living in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, so thank you for hearing my comments, and um, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public is phone number ending in zero five two. Go ahead and unmute. Hi right there. Yes, you are. You're very quiet, but we can hear you. I noticed. Okay, thank you. I, our next public comment is phone number ending in 1705. Hi, thanks for taking my comment. Um, I think the big problem with Map 1 and 3 are that they, they go all the way from Bay and Mission, really the heart of the west side, through the beach flat, all the way to the far east side, past by Harvard. So I don't think that there is anyone who actually lives in the city of Santa Cruz who would say that poses a community of interest. And I think it really grossly violates that um, that principle. I understand there's issues trying to make all it, there's compromises with all the districts when you move a part of. Uh, neighborhood out of one district that's going to another district and all these rules 
but I really think that District 4, 601 and 603 are really out of line. And um, even in 602, District 4 is a little marginal. It goes all the way from high school west side through the end of the beach flat. So I think that 602 is the best three, but I still don't think uh, because of District 4, I still don't think it's that great. And uh, there was a prior caller who said that the one was the best for kind of um, not diluting the vote of in town folk from university. I actually don't think that is the best job of kind of uh, keeping the university together as a community of interest in. Um, yeah, so that's uh, one comment. And then uh, following on Council Member uh, Brown's comments about the university having a much lower registration rate, that's true, but that actually gives the university more power. And I have a corollary that kind of a unique situation in Santa Cruz because the university is exempt from all municipal codes. So I wonder how that works where the university could potentially get its own council member would be voting to enact laws by every other city except the district that they represented. And I'm wondering if the demographer could, or the city attorney could comment on that because it seems pretty undemocratic that um, you could have someone elected by a district who's deciding laws and someone else that applied. I don't know that's more relevant um, as a university almost as its own district, but I'd like to hear um, some of the experts' comments on that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, member of the public is named Dennis. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Welcome. Hello. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Um, I would like to about uh, the Lower West Side. Um, in both maps 601 and 603, uh, the Lower West Side is kept together as a district. Um, I believe that the entire length of West Cliff and the uh, residential areas uh, inland from West Cliff Drive uh, share uh, a sense of community and, and many issues. I believe that map 602 splitting um, it in half kind of artificially between District 3 and District 6 does not make sense. Um, District 3 would extend from Lighthouse Field all the way up to, to close to the university on Nobel Drive. And I don't think that uh, that has a sense of community or of a district. So again, I, I would support 601 and 603 because of the District 6 uh, boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller is a phone number ending in 704. Press star, unmute yourself. There we go. Hi there. Hello. 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 Uh, yes. Um, I, I want to ask the demographer, is there any objective way of finding a neighborhood? I like listening to a lot of people expressing all different kinds of views about neighborhoods, and they all have different ideas. Uh, am I right in thinking there's no objective way? It's just that whoever, everyone has their own concept and doesn't necessarily agree with many other people. And if that is the case, then it seems like drawing of the district is a very arbitrary, intense uh, process, which really doesn't mean anything as far as democracy is concerned. I'd like to comment on that, please. So for public comment, we do not do Q&A. You have a full three minutes, like you, with 
your comment and uh okay okay uh that's it's done i would think well i'm it's unfortunate that that is but again that is the rule but i think conversations are very very educational and people learn from them and they're interested but i can't have that i'd like to uh on a river point that uh, a proportional system allows them to uh, line up with other persons uh, uh, that they agree with. So they are choosing own uh, or by someone else's idea of what a neighborhood You have and the chance of being equally represented. Uh, I'd like to keep there. Uh, uh, having a district, especially in the way it's going now, not really uh, conducive for this. Thank you for letting me ask the question. Thank you. Our next caller is Denon Boyatiko. Hi, I'm on 1% battery here, so excuse me if I cut out midway through, but I really wanted to express the support for MAP 603 and also uh, the draft map that a lot of some campus pros for seven different proposal uh, really highly encourage those offers to be chosen. And I really want to just comment on the narrative that students uh, might have outside the city or, you know, have an impact, even though technically they aren't part of the city, but I think that I get through the problem students are people, students are residents. I think we have just as much of, you know, right to be represented as anybody else. And the fact that, you know, 30,000, uh, oh, sorry, 20,000 staff and faculty attend UCIC out of a city of 60,000, 30%, we haven't seen that kind of representation in a long time, is something really worth considering. So that's why we support 603 and the draft proposal for really goes ahead and keeps the downtown together, keeps the Lower West Side together, and guarantees that the East Side is also fairly represented. Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller, we're taking public comment on the six district map. Beverly Deshaux. Hi, this is Beverly Deshaux. Um, I'm wondering, did I miss something in the beginning of this presentation? Like, why is this happening in the first place? Why are we suddenly breaking the city up into neighborhoods? And yes, I agree, you know, who, who decides what a neighborhood is? And there's a confusion here about that, although you're not, what I understand is that you said not allowed groupings by interests yet. <clears throat> Making them by neighborhood, so I, that's a, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a bit confusing. Um, but you know, wh why, why is this all of a sudden happening? Who decided? This? Um, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it at all. Um, it's it's dividing up our city. And so, is there someone or a group of people who are more knowledgeable than I? who are overseeing this to make sure that this is not a gerrymandering move. Um, really. Um, uh, let's see, so the other thing that I don't like is that now suddenly a person who is being elected has to live in the neighborhood. That's a very limiting thing. What if there, you know, what if there isn't anyone, the neighborhood is, qualified or who feels like running, um, who has the time, who's like not working jobs. That's, you know, there's a, there's an equity issue here, I believe. I mean, really for people who have time, okay, but for people who don't, then they don't get to be represented. I, you know, this is, um, I don't like, um, yeah, so who's, who's overseeing to make sure this isn't a gerrymandering move. Okay, that's my two cents. Three or four. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next name is Catherine.
Welcome. Catherine, let's see, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself or select unmute on your computer. Hi, this is Catherine, and I need to say that you had called on me previously, and, and so I was surprised that you called on me again. So um, I, I am the one who made the comment that um, I didn't use the word gerrymander, but that's the feeling that Upper West Side uh, residents, uh, if you include 200 homes of Upper West Side residents in with UCSC, uh, those residents are definitely going to feel gerrymandered. Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller, I am watching you. Yes, hello. Uh, I suppose on further reflection, I, I suppose 601 map is my preference, but I could also see alterations starting with that that might have more consensus. Uh, you know, I tried using that map drawing application. Wow, that's too hard to use. Uh, I, I question just as a just a statement that uh, Hispanic race has been ever been a factor in elections. Uh, you know, I have I looked at like the last four elections, and and I said this in my letter. I don't have to explain it all again, but really, people have been elected uh, amazingly more so by how many people run with identical politics and when the you know when one you know, like leftists or sort of leftist center people when one side or the other has more people running they lose because their vote is diluted so i i don't know uh like i i do not think that uh maria was it malvinus or whatever I, I don't think she lost because she was panic i think she lost because she ran in a year when there were way too many people with her politics you know, you check it for yourself. I mean, it's not that's not hard to uh, to do. And then looking at the you know out uh, composition of the council, it's 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 not you know centered against minorities or anything. If anything, like I said before, I mean, white men are left out of the picture maybe, but that's all I can think there. Um, I I would say I I'm kind of disappointed. It's too late now, but it. Um, too late now, but I, I, the runoff thing, I just can't see you needing it. I mean, only 10 people ran for the entire city last year. I can't see three people running in any of these districts to require a runoff. I, I, maybe, maybe one will, and then you have to do the runoff, but they have to run for a whole year, you know, to, uh, run during the primaries. I, I don't, I don't get it. Um, and, um. Uh, uh, well, I mentioned before about the two and four year mayor thing, too late for that. But uh, I think, uh, well, yeah, like, well, it's Joe Biden. I mean, boy, it would be nice to have another election this November, don't you think? Anyway, um, I, I mostly, though, I would in this meeting, if possible, please clarify the details of what happens to the existing council members with two more years to go on their term and how you will decide which district vote. Uh, in 2022, once you pick them, and why? Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller, the phone number ending in 704. Yes, uh, I'm responding to the last uh, citizen. Uh, problem that that you know sometimes the voters having a hard time hearing you. You're cutting out. Do you want me to unmute him, Mayor? He already spoke. Oh, I see. I I, I muted him. I can unmute. Him. But, yeah, go go ahead and um. Unmute and go ahead, caller. Oh. Hi there. Hello again. 
already <laughs> spoken? Call in earlier? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yes, I did, but I wanted to respond to the, uh, uh, just the, the gentleman that spoke just before me now. Uh, the, his point is that uh, votes are diluted between a number of candidates who have similar uh, ideas about what, what would be good for the city. Uh, the, the, that is a definitely a problem, but uh, voters may want to consider the adoption of ranked choice voting, which largely solves that problem because uh, voters can rank all those candidates uh, that they want to, and then uh, the one that will get the most votes from all those all all those uh, people who like that kind of outlook, uh, they can concentrate their vote event in event. Their counted so their votes will be concentrated, and they will have a better chance of electing at least one of those people they like. Where in the in the current uh, voting system, uh, they don't have that. So rank choice voting for voting for one winner uh, uh, makes makes the situation a bit better. So we are taking public comment on the six district map uh, and this agenda item. And are there any other members of the public that would like that haven't already been comment? Okay. Looks like that's it. I will bring it back to Council, and um, there were some questions that were brought up in um, public comment that I would like to um, ask staff or and or Doug Johnson um, to answer. Um, one of the questions I can go ahead, there was a caller who said, why? Are we breaking the city up into districts? And I just want to direct that member of the public to the information on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com slash district elections. And there is a wealth of information at cityofsantacruz.com slash district elections. Um, there was a question about what happens when there is no candidate that runs in a district. Are you able to answer that? Sure. I'm happy to. It's just like any vacancy. Um, the council, I, the city attorney or staff may would come in. I don't know if your partner has special provisions. Typically, the council would decide whether to appoint an application process hold a special election. It was just like their big. Thank you. And there was a question about what size what a neighborhood is. What constitutes in a, a neighborhood? I yes, there's a very in-depth discussion of that in the prior two hearings that folks can go back to, but very briefly, the law Kind of blends the two ideas, but really there are two separate interests between what's a community of interest versus what's a neighborhood. So a community of interest is a, a still a geographically defined area, but it's defined by demographic and social characteristics such as it could be ethnicity, but it's more commonly uh, renters, income levels, education levels. The big one is language spoken at home. And it can also be issue driven. So a community, as the uh, council member Cummings mentioned earlier about a neighborhood that's particularly hit by traffic in the summer, that would be. So those kinds of laws specific about a, the social, economic, or issue driven group geographic area. A neighborhood is much more self-defined. In some cities, they have formally recognized neighborhoods. Uh, the most common ones are, are master planning communities, historic districts, but other cities also have gone through and like, formally identified neighborhoods. Use those, but ultimately, a neighborhood is whatever the people in it find as a neighborhood. So, 
if, if people view their neighborhood as the area around the park, area around the school, anything that ties those neighborhoods together um, meet the, the definition. So it really is self-defined. There isn't a, uh, the Census Bureau does not define neighborhood uh, for the whole country. It's much more, whatever the residents view as their neighborhood, is their neighborhood, and they may disagree or, or may consider themselves parts of multiple. And the last question I had was um, a caller stated that the university would be exempt from muni codes and how does that work with council member enacting laws that do not apply to that? I, I would briefly say that's not a concern uh, that factors into district redistricting. And for more details, I would refer you over to city staff for the city. It is, <laughs> it is correct that um, city regulations in general don't apply to the university campus, but there are certainly issues that people who reside on the campus uh, would would uh, be affected by by decisions of the city council, and um, and and therefore have a very legitimate basis to weigh in on university or city policies. So, um, so there's not a legal impediment to somebody who lives on campus. Uh, participating in city politics merely because uh, city zoning regulations and whatnot don't apply on the campus. Thank you. Okay, um, council member Cumming, do you have a comment? I have a, um, <clears throat> one question I wanted to follow up on, and I, I guess it's a comment to what um, was just stated in addition to that, um, you know, People who live on campus aren't isolated from living on campus. They're going to freely move throughout the community. And given that campus is part of the city, uh, the fact that some laws or regulations don't apply to people on campus, that's not to say that campus is like an island where people can never leave. So just wanted to put that out there as well because, you know, if people are shopping in town or what have you, they're going to be subjected to the same laws as people who are living in the rest of the community. Uh, but the question I did have, and I'm going to ask this again later um, is uh, to follow up on one of the questions that was asked during um, public comment, which was given the outlay of maps, how will um, the upcoming election work in 2022 given the options that we have? Because um, like myself, so I now live, I used to live in the beach flats, I now live downtown, but you know, that seat would be open. Um, there's the potential to be a seat open on the Lower West Side. Um, I believe that um, there's two sitting council members in District 1. I might be wrong on that. And then there's one in District 2. So that potentially leaves, depending on the map, um, three to four seats that might be open. And so I'm just kind of wondering how that might work. Because that came up in, in public comment. I had that question as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. I'm happy to address that. So the key big picture thought that governs all this is that the same number of positions on the council that are due right now to be up in 22 will still be up in. Uh, one of those, so with three coming up, one of those may be taken by the mayor slot. And so if you had a six district map plus the mayor, there'd be the mayor plus two districts. If you had seven districts, it would be uh, three districts holding the line. Um, if you have a six district map, then the other four districts would be up in 2024. Um, Actually, both ways. You'll have four districts that would hold elections, or the four who do not hold elections. Give a little bit more detail because um, there was a related question from the public about what happens to current council members who are up until 2024. You would actually remain council members till 2024. I mentioned there's no impact on your current term. And you would actually be at large, citywide council members, 
until 2024. The rule is you represent whatever jurisdiction elected. So even in 2023, if a someone elected citywide in 2029 and leave leaves a vacancy, that placement, either a special election appointment, would be a citywide vote because you're filling the last year of that wide at large. So it, it, it does get speaking in generalities about the rule, it can be hard to wrap your head around it in different scenarios, but uh, but we will definitely walk through in detail um, map by map a couple of final maps. The, it, it, in some jurisdictions, it's really easy because one council member ends up in each seat, so that each district just gets assigned to that council member here. Um, as you can see on these PDFs, every map has some pairing of, of council members who are in separate years, and that gets very complicated. We'll spend a lot of time talking about our viewers. Does that help? It helps a little. It's it's still a little. So I guess yeah, it's a little confusing. Um, I wonder the maps that um, are on the city website show proposed election sequence and alternative election sequence, and it lists each council member and what that they would be in for 2022 and 2024. And that was really helpful to me. See, I'm not seeing that on this slide. Um, however, those um, graph maps, 601, do show um, current council council members proposed district and uh, um, election went. I can show one of those if you'd like me to yeah, bring up. Yeah, that might give a good visual. Just to show an example here, this is 603. Um, all of them have the language in the bottom left. Uh, as a six district map, it'll have the mayor plus seats up this year. Um, because in this map, Councilmember Cummins is the only, only 2022 council member who's alone in the district, not paired with any other council member, at least district four, the district four would definitely be up. Then district three is the vacancy, so while District 6 has uh, a mix of council members. So the difference between the proposed and the alternate, and, then, and, and I should clarify, there's no policy preference for the proposed over the alternate. Uh, a poorly worded law says must show a proposed election sequence, so we just had to pick proposed on one of them. But there's no, it's no better than the alternate. In the proposed sequence, the vacant seat is up in 2022, and then the seat that has 2022 members and 2024 members is up in. You see, in the alternate, that flips. That vacant seat moves to 2024 with um, the districts that only have 2024 council members, and the mixed seat moves to 2022. So that's kind of walking through the reason that seat quit, switches from one scenario to another that seat has 2022 council member in it, and it has a 2024 council member. So the council will have to wrestle with which is the better year. Um, where there's only one council member, of course, the seat just gets a year of vacancy. The kind of key impact of this is, I mean, there's obviously lots of interest of so if a, if a council member whose current term ends in 2022 ends up in a district that doesn't come up for election until 2024, this will be that council member's last leave. When this term ends, there's nowhere for them to run. So they would leave and they'd have to wait years and then come again. On the flip side, if a council member whose term is up in 2024 
ends up in a 2022 seat, that council member has a choice. It's um, the council member could just serve the rest of this term to 2024. That they they're entitled to that, and then in 2024 leave the council because they would resign as he not up. The other option, and this is the twist that rarely happens, but I'm aware of it happening twice. The 2024 council member can actually run midterm 2022 as if running for state assembly. And if the council member wins that seat, they're sworn into the 2022 district and they resign the last years of their at large seat, leaving two year at large vacancy. Um, of course, they'd be running against a, another council member whose term ends. But often that's the way it goes because at least it gives each council member the option to run. No one is forced off without the option. Um, I do often um, emphasize that if you end up in that scenario, we hope that everyone will, will keep the election civil. Because if the 2022 council member wins, 2024 council member is still on the council for two more years. You would actually end up sitting next to the person you just ran against on the dais. So we hope that they will keep that uh, professional on the issues and not end up with the hostility that spills over to the council. But as I mentioned, that doesn't usually happen. Usually one or the other doesn't run again, but uh, we are aware of two situations where someone has run midterm in that. I guess a follow-up question, at what point do we kind of set out those kind of provisions of how we're going to set up the election? I mean, I, I guess a lot of that depends on the outcome in June um, with whether we go to six or seven. Um, but then at the same time, yeah, just kind of curious, like when, because this is something we need to prepare for now in terms of all these different scenarios. So. I'm mm -hmm. just kind of curious about you know how that's coming along and what we're kind of doing as a city to prepare for different types of alternatives and options around elections. I believe, and, and Casey and, and the attorney jump in if I, if I mistake this, but I typically the, would need to determine the sequence at the time that you choose the map. You'll be needing to choose the sequence for your six, six district map and need to choose your sequence for your seven district map. So as, as you know, sometimes this can be an issue um, that factored into which map is, is selected and that is certainly allowed in an appropriate policy. Solid on that, Doug. And our hope is that we'll resolve the map and the sequencing in the near future. Not not out closer to the uh, ballot. I know we have another series of maps, so I'm going to hold the rest of my comments because some of them apply to. That. So I'll just I'm gonna, I'll end my comments there, and I have more to say around the questions. Uh, okay, Council Member Myers. I have a question about this: the uh, sort of how the proposed election sequencing, um, maybe for Tony, um, for, for um, uh, Doug, my understanding is that we have, so we have to, we will be doing an ordinance to adopt districts. Do we also at the same time adopt, if, is that, is that an actual ordinance action or is that, how do those two Not sure who, who, maybe Tony, Doug. Yeah, Tony, go ahead unless you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's contemplated that that would be part of the ordinance. So, okay, so that's um, where that that's where that sequence comes in, Tony. So you would you would adopt a right map, and then you would also define the sequencing to begin in twenty twenty two. That's uh, right. Okay, and can that sequence ever be changed by a vote of the people for a charter amendment or something? It could be changed by a charter amendment or by, um, well, I'd have to research whether it could be changed by subsequent ordinance. Um, but I think once it's set in 
once it's established, the intent is that it would remain in that sequence going. I think that my one comment would be stability is always the best, uh, soon would be, would be the best policy for, uh, for this kind of major change. So thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, we, we worked with one or two jurisdictions that have, for various reasons, mainly because they're adding seats, needed to alter the sequence a little bit. And as we mentioned, you can't alter the term of someone that's already in office. So you end up, the only way to really alter it is a vote, and you have to do a two-year term. Um, so to change the sequence of a seat, you hold an election for a two-year seat, and it goes back to a four-year seat after that. So someone would have to run and run again. Um, so it, it is very difficult and, and to your point of stability, very uh, destabilizing. Yeah. But in your case, as you look at having two seats, if, if you go with the mayor option, two seats plus the mayor and then four seats, if you ever wanted to try to get that to three, you would have that. just want to apologize to my colleagues and public and to the mayor. Um, unfortunately, I have to jump off. I will try to come back in, but I do need to jump off. Learn a little bit about what the governor did today with the executive order on water. So I'm sorry <laughs> to have to leave, but uh, I'm going to get all the way from the well. I'll try to come back in, though. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Okay, so we received a presentation. Uh, Council Member Cummings? Sorry, Sorry I, did, I did have one more question. I realized that the next item, since it doesn't deal with the direct like mayor, that it wouldn't be appropriate for me to ask this question at that time. So <clears throat> um, the one question I did have uh, along the lines of the direct like mayor is, should that pass, does that mean that the council would have to have the direct like mayor during this election cycle, or would there be the opportunity or the option for them to choose to have the direct like mayor happen during presidential election years, just given that in non-presidential years, there's lower voter turnout and than in presidential years. And so it might make sense that if we're going to move with a direct like mayor, that that would happen during a year when you'd have higher voter turnout. So I'm just curious whether, um, if that were to pass with, with that charter amendment, then kind of restrict to the election of the, of the, of the directly elected mayor to being in kind of non-presidential years. And I don't know if that's the developer or the city attorney. Uh, I, I guess unless Doug has an answer to that, I, I'd ask you to hold that thought because um, I didn't review the proposed charter amendment uh, preparing for this. So I, I want to take a look at that to see if that specifies when the first election of the directly elected mayor would be. Uh, but if it doesn't, then I believe that the council would have some uh, authority to make that poll when you adopt it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we received a presentation from the city's dem dem demographic consultant, demographer, uh, <clears throat> Doug Johnson, and National Demographic Corporation regarding the draft six district maps and election sequencing um, and received public input on the draft map election. Um, we will now move on to our next agenda item after a five-minute break. So we will return in five minutes and then return to the next item on the agenda. on your cameras. Welcome back. Thank you for that short break. We will continue with our next agenda item. Uh, before you go there, Mayor, um, I do have an answer to Council Member Cummings' question. That, oh, great. Yeah, the proposed charter amendment does contemplate the mayoral election occurring in 2022. Uh, 
it doesn't expressly require it, but it does um, does state that for the purposes of the election of a mayor and council members in the year 2022, for timing reasons, only one round of election will be held, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, my interpretation of the charter amendment is that it, it would, um, you know, if the, if the election uh, charter amendment passes and if the vote is certified by the July 6th deadline, then there would be a mayoral election uh, in November of 2020. Yes. Um, I also just wanted to ask if council, I think it might be appropriate if council members have opinions on the maps that have been reviewed or on changes that they would like to, that you would like to see made to any of the draft maps that have been discussed. Um, it might be uh, useful to get that feedback so that we can bring that back to the council when you meet again on the 19th of April. Okay. We will vote oh, council member coming. Is that a question? question? Tony, is that in addition to what we've, I mean, if we've already kind of expressed some changes we want to see, are you asking that we send follow up emails with that in writing or any additional comments? Sorry, I, I suppose you could send follow up comments, but I think it would be useful to give and some limited direction to, um, to staff and the consultant so that we're not going back and preparing a multitude of additional maps. So if the council has a preference, uh, even if it's a preference for, you know, some people commented on liking um, the east side of one map and the west side of it, and the council, you know, wanted to give any sort of direction or by consensus um, indicated preference if it would be appropriate to do that now. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like um, more specific direction based on the question comment. For example, Black Ocean Corridor, the Lower West Side, and Seabright area um, too. So, um, no, it seemed like there were three considerations um, really focused on for um, additional map draft um, and whatever that looks like in terms of all the requirements, population, um, equality, and all the other requirements. Um, does that, are you looking for more specific direction or? I guess I would defer to, to Doug on, on that question um, if he feels like he has some direction or, or to staff uh, some ideas about what how, how we might modify maps or what we should bring back and focus on for the next. Yes, I think the, you know, the three you just mentioned, I, I think we're just the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, I think those three are, are sufficient for those goals, but um, the city attorney's point I want to make sure there wasn't a, another thought that someone had mind had been vocalized. Thank you. I think um, uh, council members, if you receive any other input um, as soon as possible to uh, send that on in addition to those three, then I know Doug would appreciate it in order to have draft maps crafted and posted at least seven days for our next public hearing. Mayor, if I might, just there, there's been a couple of questions about how do we guard against gerrymandering or anything like that. And just a point of certainly welcome any thoughts. The way we handle messages that come in outside of a public meeting is that we would come back and say, here's the map that implements a request from council member X. So we continue to have that full transparency. Um, even if it's a thought you have tomorrow or the next topic. Have those. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Um, 
Are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? Like we are. Next up on the agenda is public hearing to receive input from the community regarding the selection of a seven district map and election. Right. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item that you would like to comment on, now is the time. Call in using instructions on your the order will be a presentation of the item from staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council. Sure, to hear, are you um, here and to translate that? Sure, I will. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Buenas tardes. Esta hora, esta sesión es para el habl hablar y debatir. El, 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 sobre las elecciones y tener esta vez vamos a hablar de los seis distritos eh, la posibilidad de seis distritos primero va a haber una posición de los de la, del personal de la ciudad después de eso se va a eh, debatir entre los concejales y después se va a abrir otra vez la sesión para comentarios al público gracias gracias ok I will now hand this over to our staff, Casey Hemard and demographer Doug Johnson with National Demographic Corporation. Welcome back. You're up, Doug. Sounds Thank good. You. I have a shorter presentation without all the introduction stuff. Um, but uh, just as briefly, we still have the same federal state requirements. The rules are the exact same depending on whether or not you're drawing a six or seven, and then the traditional criteria are the same. Um, obviously, uh, because we're drawing seven districts now, 63,000 people in the city have not changed. So we're with six, six districts, district aim to be a little bit over 10,000. With seven, we're aiming to be right about 9,000. So each district is a, a bit smaller, we get seven districts. And so as was somewhat previewed in some of the public comment, um, it is possible now to draw a purely university, District 7, as you see in the map 101. And then actually to the, the point that Councilmember Cummins was making about uh, district map, in this case, our District 4 crosses the river, puts, puts the, the two sides of the river together. Um, uh, that largely happens because District 2 is smaller, so it does not extend, other than right at the, the water, it doesn't extend all the way over to the river. Um, we still keep a, a northeastern, kind of both sides of the freeway, District 1. Um, get a much more concentrated uh, District 5, their West Cliff Drive and above that. And then uh, over on the west side, 101, there's again that Western District we saw earlier, but now because it's smaller, it does not extend up into the university. So, and then in this one, you get the university, as I mentioned, all in District 7 is all university, and then three is really the, the um, northeast side of Bay Street mixing university. That's map 101. Map 102. Rotate instead of again instead of having three districts on the on the water, it says two, and this is a little bit of the idea that we talked about earlier about shifting those two. So that now you have district four on the water, district two is going to be inland. Uh, you can see it jogs a little bit up and down, but really, Moral and Buena Vista are the two boundary roads. Uh, also, tried to show a different approach to district one, where instead of it being well, that's the whole freeway corridor. This map, uh, districts one and three get considerable freeway area. That means that district one comes farther south over on the side of town. So along Frederick Street, that neighborhood becomes part of district. Um, district seven is still university dominant. It's a little bit different. Really, one thing we always try to do in these maps is give you a variety of options. Um, there aren't a lot of ways to draw that seven uh, without getting fairly whacked how it ends up. 
So this one's slight changes, but given the population, there's not a lot of variety in what we see. Um, and then over the west end of town, you can see again, we this one takes a very different approach of rotating five and six. So this six no longer comes down to the water, it just goes road. Goes um, five takes the whole ocean parallel. The third and final one. This is the um, the look at can we draw even in seven districts, could we have two seats that are in the university? So this would show um, how we get two seats in the university. Really, the goal of the difference is to prompt that question we were discussing earlier about um, different communities might benefit from being in one seat or might benefit from being in multiple seats. We want to show an option that would clearly um, meet all the rules, but still have two seats first. So you get that in this map, really Bay Street running, um, change the names up farther in north, but uh, Bay Street becomes the defining factor left uh, the district seven. Um, seven does then, because it's not all university, it then does come down Bay Street into non-university um, neighborhoods and pick up population. Get uh, six, and in this case, now because seven's coming down to get population, Six becomes that L shape, go around it, get population six. And then five, this is similar to the 602 map, right? Where you saw it going from Cliff Drive up, uh, in this case, all the way up past. And in this case, we get a, 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 again, that horizontal two and four, but a different configuration that people thinking about and wondering about what really are the, the boundaries that make sense over there on the side of town. A lot of flexibility there, uh, as long as we're making trades that are equal in population, you can shift, use Broadway, or go all the way to Frederick, use Wyndham, those kinds of things are possible. So perhaps even more than the six district maps, these three seven district uh, maps are concepts designed to start the discussion and get your reactions. And tell each the other thing I should mention is that I, I don't have it in this presentation, but it was mentioned by um, uh, someone from the university called in earlier. There was a, there is a map that's come in that they sent in and asked, could we take a glance at it and see if it looked like it was legal? Um, which uh, Casey and I worked together and we got back to them on that. It wasn't clear at that time whether they wanted it posted yet or if they were just getting that back. Now that it's been mentioned in the previous hearing, we will post it. And Doug, I also, um I want to mention that was included in the um, attachments uh, to the agenda package, that, that map and um, their specific feedback and the demographic data that you generated. That's part of the package that the council received. So it's gone to the council and it's on the, uh, the agenda page for this meeting. And we'll get it up. The only reason it isn't, it wasn't clear whether they actually wanted it. Now that they propose it, we'll certainly. So, uh, same questions this time of which maps you prefer, and um, among your preferred maps, what would make them even better? We have the same slide. Thank you. Um, let's see, we had um, questions and a lot of comments already come in through the interactive um, site, which thank you, that was really helpful to read through. And it seems that I think it was over 70% preferred map 101 um, over the other two. Um, I will see if council members have any questions. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins. I don't think I have any questions. I think it kind of, we got at a lot of the bigger earlier for me. So thank you, Mayor. Council member Folder. I haven't had time. I, I, yeah, I don't have any questions this time. And then council member Brown. Have any questions? Don't, I'll, I'll just save my comments for after. Okay. 
Council Member Cumming, do you have any questions on these maps? Not so much questions. I do have some comments on the maps. So I can either say them now or wait. Okay, let's, let's go through the questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Council Member Kellen Terry Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, also no. Okay. It, I will take it out to public comment then for the seven district maps or draft maps. Uh, if you are interested in commenting on the seven district maps and election sequence items, raise your hand either by calling by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raised hand in the webinar controls of your computer. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set for three minutes. I will go out to the and a hands raised. And the first name is Dennis. Go ahead and unmute yourself. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Um, Number 102 uh, for the west side of Cruz, I believe, truly reflects communities. It keeps all of the lower west side together along West Cliff, then the upper west side together, diversity together. I think map number 103 for the west side is a disaster. Um, it, uh, District 5 in this map goes from Lighthouse Field up to High Street. And that is not, that is just not a key. Uh, uh, also, um, housing are along Columbia Avenue in the lower west side. One side of the street would be in one district and the other side would be another. And that is a very, very arbitrary uh, delineation. So at least for the west side, I think map 103 is terrible. Uh, but west side, in my opinion, map 102 uh, reflects who. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is phone number ending in 0252. Comment on seven district map. Go ahead and press star. Yes, you are welcome. Can you say what that again? Okay. What is it? What is it? Ending. What is it? That's one case. Other league.
Thank you. Let's see, I have a caller ending in 1705 is the number, and we're taking public comment on this agenda item, seven district map election. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I think map 101 by far is the best. The, these um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. I think Map 101 is the best piece. I um, want to revisit my comments on the six map. I mean, this is related even more so with seven districts regarding the university district. And my comment was completely misconstrued. I, I absolutely believe that everyone deserves to represent on council. <laughs> my point was in certain areas, such as land use planning, housing, uh, and housing, universities are completely exempt from municipal codes. So it seems really unfair and democratic that a representative of a single district that is completely exempt from municipal control would have a vote in determining what goes on in every single district besides its it represents. So here's an example. The residential rental code fine. Um, relocation payment ordinance. Just cause rank control. All these things <clears throat> a representative that represented exclusively the university would be able to vote to implement in every area of the city except for the district which it represents which that representative, that council member represents. I think, of course, I believe everyone should have a vote, everyone should have a representative on council, but it should be some process where either the university agrees to check itself those municipal ordinances or that council member has to choose for issues where its own district was exempt. So um, please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I do believe that everyone serves a representative. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. It uh, looks like that will conclude our public comment on the agenda item of seven district map. Um, there was, I will bring it back to the council uh, and I did want to ask the question for maybe staff. Um, there was a, a, for a comment or a question regarding someone who was not able to navigate the technology to see the map. Have there been in person or other options um, available for community members to access the map? Absolutely. We uh, thank you, Mayor Brenner. We have had the maps publicly available in multiple locations, including London Nelson and the library. I am also happy um, to facilitate getting um, our our, citizen, our local citizen uh, a set of the maps um, and whatever resources they need. Um, so I I, I will I want to make sure that whoever wants to understand this has all the resources. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, at this point, we have now made a presentation on the seven district maps. And we didn't specify the, or discuss the election team on these maps. Um, Doug Johnson, I wonder if you can just briefly speak to that aspect of the map. Certainly happy to. Um, ends up being very similar um, number of districts each up. Up each year is a little simpler because there's no mayor question. So it would be three seats will be up in 2022. 
and four seats will be up in 2024. Um, let me share very brief uh, the PDFs so people can. Um, for example, this is map 101. The one thing that happens in 101 that I don't think happened in any of the six district maps is that uh, we have two vacancies. So you can see for 101, the proposal is uh, the proposed versus the alternate. We have two vacancies. So that could either way, one of those vacancies would be up in 2022, uh, the other one up in 2024. That would be completely up to public comment and the uh, council's ultimate decision to say, does it make more sense for district, in this case, um, six or seven um, up in 2022 under the uh, proposed election? That's factors that could play in there. I think. Um, uh, we're already touched on a little bit. If a district is traditionally low turnout, then we we tend to recommend putting that on the presidential year so that there's more voters turning out in that election. So that can be one factor. The the only legal guidance on that is to sequence to come up with a sequence in line with the goals of the California Voting Rights Act. So if you had a vacant seat, um that was heavily Latino or another protected class um, that didn't have a council, you know, historically was not represented, didn't have a council member, that would, um, it, that actually leads to an interesting challenge. If you want that seat up right away, so it gets the legislator as soon as possible, or probably more likely you want that seat up in a presidential year, um, the reason for, that even though we mean waiting a little bit, is that this decision, as we talked about earlier, is actually permanent. So getting someone elected two years sooner um, probably isn't worth being in the low turnout election. Um, whereas if you put it in a presidential year, get that turnout bump, get that turnout bump. I don't know that that really plays in here as much, but I leave that to you, your discretion in the end to say, Six versus seven, which if you went with those like, um, if you flip that, then where the the district five that has multiple council members in it, then the two vacancies happen. As you go through the different maps, there are different options, um, but all the options out to three seats, four seats. Thank you. All right. Um, that uh, very helpful to see and hear. Thank you. I'm just seeing my notes here. Okay, I'm going to bring it to council. Uh, and council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Are are the six district maps, the seven district maps, so are they aligned? Like does one sort of map? I mean, I know obviously there's one with six and one with seven, but are we trying to like um, do the groupings of neighborhoods similarly? Question. Sure. Um, they aren't really aligned. Okay. Um, there's no. There's certainly no correlation between maps match best. Um, it may be useful for me to briefly show the interactive map um, because that's the easiest way to compare the map. Mm. Um, show that just so people are familiar with what yeah. it can do. Um, there you go. Look at that. So in this map, you have all the maps over on the right hand side and you can click and change from map to map, obviously. And you can even enter an address and zoom in. You, know, you can also, a little odd name, but if you change the base map gallery, click on that option, you can change to a satellite as well. So if you, if you get in, that's often, if you really want to see where the lines are, that can help. But to your point, um, you can compare the maps by, set, by turning them on. Together, so I mean, 
though, you can see the differences between 101 and 103 are where there are lighter colors, where the colors stay bright to match. Mm -hmm. If you try to compare 101 to 601, you get some. So you can see District 1 is almost identical to both. Here's the extra thousand people that it gets. Mm -hmm. So this is a handy way to compare maps. Okay. Where do they match? And then the lighter colors are where they differ. There's definitely some similarities between 101 and 601, uh, mm -hmm. but then, um, but that that's probably the most useful tool that's linked on the city's project website. Um, okay. And if you pull this, I'll send this PowerPoint. Oh, wait, uh, this PowerPoint will go on the website. I just sent it about an hour ago. It's okay. not there yet, but uh, people can get the link to that as well. Okay, thank you. Council member coming. I did want to follow up. There was a question from a member of the public related to ranked choice voting and how that might be able to suffice the um, issues with the California Voting Rights Act. And so I'm wondering maybe if the city attorney might be able to comment on that question that was asked. <clears throat> you know, rather than moving into sure. central for choice voting. Now, I might as well talk about both issues. Um, it is correct that the Santa Monica case is pending before the California Supreme Court. Um, and if the California Supreme Court uh, upholds the decision of the Court of Appeal, then that might have a bearing on whether or not um, the city is legally obligated to transition to uh, district elections. Um, it, but it, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the city is immune from liability under the California Voting Rights Act. Um, each you know, as as you're aware, um, vast majority of cases. In fact, I think Santa Monica is the unique exception. Um, cities have either capitulated or or lost um, most Voting Rights Act challenges in California. Um, there is a, a friend of the court brief filed by the Attorney General in the Santa Monica case, in which um, in which the Attorney General makes a statement that. Uh, alternative forms of uh, of elections, such as ranked choice voting, uh, could be an alternative to district elections. Um, the, the problem is it it is not a it's not a legal precedent whereby a court has ordered a city to transition to to rank choice voting. So there's a little bit of risk associated with that. And of the remedies that might be available. Um, District elections is the only one that is actually specified by um, the California Voting Rights Act. Although, um, as I said, uh, arguably an alternative uh, mechanism like ranked choice voting could uh, address a Voting Rights Act uh, lawsuit. We just add to that too, one practical bit is while your Latino percentage is almost identical to Santa Monica's, um, Santa Monica does have three Latinos on it, so it's a. You know, I think there's going to be a. If Santa Monica does prevail in support, I think there'll be a lot of people that say yay, and then they'll read the decision and realize it doesn't help. So it will be. It's not so much if Santa Monica wins or not. It does Santa Monica win, and on what basis do they win? It will. Forever. And and to the. Just as Sydney Attorney was saying, the, from from my practical perspective, if you're in districts, they can't sue you. The CBRA is a safe harbor. If you have an alternate system, they can sue you, and it might be a successful defense, but you still have to pay for it. Now, thanks. And then um, I had a few comments. Um, similarly, I'm wondering. If Put the maps up as well. Sure. So it's um, similar to what um, individual thought. Well, one uh, one hundred and one seems like you know, in terms of some of the issues we've heard around Seabright, 
um, that it kind of addresses that along with some issues with kind of the beach flats and lower lower ocean, although it could also, you know, shift a little bit further south, have more of that ocean street corridor um, incorporated into District 4. So if there's a way that that might be able to come forward, it would be good to see what that option could look like. Um, just because, again, from demographic, socioeconomic perspectives, there's a lot of similarities between people who live from the beach flats all the way up to that ocean corridor. And that might be a reasonable voting block in terms of trying to keep those people together. Um, but at the same time, you know, wouldn't the person who called in about map 102 with the west side, lower west side and the upper west side kind of staying in their own areas make sense as well? Those are pretty contiguous neighborhoods that have shared interests. Uh, I would say also with number 103, though, that um, one of the benefits is one, one of the members of the public pointed out that students do make up 30% of the population in the city of Santa Cruz. So having two representatives on the council could be a benefit. And with the map in 103, it also allows for if students want to move off campus, that there are places where they can move to in the city that wouldn't keep them restricted to kind of that campus area like they do in 101 and 102. Um, at the same time, though, that by sharing um, that broader space, there is the potential for students to not be elected because they're then competing with people who have um, more access, access to financial resources. So um, just wanted to put those comments out there on the maps. Um, and then um, in addition to that, um, I, it would be good. Like, thank you for also showing the online tools and something that might be worth adding to those layers is the socioeconomic map with kind of percentage of renters and also the demographics map so that people can see that as you kind of overlay where these districts are, they can see how that impacts where um, people of different socioeconomic classes and also different demographics live within those areas. Um, and then the last comment I want to make is that, you know, I think one thing that people might not be aware of is that there's nothing legally binding us to going towards district elections. And I think one thing that's, um, you know, within the language that's been put on the ballot is that it's a little misleading because it makes people seem as if you know, we either go to six or we go to seven. But since we're giving the community an option, there really should be an option on the ballot of that we don't go to districts and that we they, the people fight. And I think there's good reason why uh, we should give people that option because um, one of the comments that was just made um, by the demographer, you know, Santa Monica has three Latinos on their city council, but we also had history Latinos run one. So David Terraza served two terms on the city council. He also served as mayor. Um, and, you know, he was elected in 2010 and in 2014, so elected twice very recently. Um, we have the past two elections, um, four African-Americans who have run and who have also won. That happened with in 2016. We had two African-Americans run in 2020 who both won, and then we had another African-American who so two African Americans who ran in 2020 and also won. Uh, we have our first Iranian representative, won in 2020. We have six women right now on our city council and one man. So there is, or and and well, six, yeah, six women and one man. So there is an argument to be made that we don't have racially polarized voting here in the city of Santa Cruz, and that should be an option as well. And one of the comments that someone made earlier as well is the socioeconomic factor really playing a huge role, which you know, even if we do move to district election um, for low-income community to run, it's really difficult because, and I'm just reverting to Transparent California, when I was mayor in 2020, I made $41,000, $41,724 as mayor and as a council member in 2019, made $20,862. So that socioeconomic factor is a really big driver in going to run uh, for office because it's extremely difficult for low-income people in this community in particular to run for office. So I just wanted to make those comments because um, 
there are a number of people, some of whom called in, who really don't want to see us go in this direction and just want to help with their voice in this conversation. Um, because that option is present ballot. Um, and I think that you know, given the options we're providing, that should be something to decide on is um, whether or not we want to say no to, no to district. Like, those are all the comments I have on this, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just wanted to see if, if maybe Doug, you could clarify for us. But what I think your point with the Santa Monica comparison was getting at is that the majority minority of that community does have representation on the council, whereas in the city of Santa Cruz, majority minority, which is the Latinx population, doesn't have representation, and therefore there's a difference. Is that accurate? Yes, you know, as your city attorney will tell you, trying to guess what the Supreme Court's going to rule is nearly impossible. And, and it's a little strange that the, we don't even have a hearing scheduled yet. Of course, we have no idea when they're actually. Um, but yes, you're correct. When uh, in Santa, Santa Monica, not only do they have three, arguably, there's a, a potential fourth Latino, depending on how you define Latino on the council and an African-American on the council. And the other twist there is that the proposed remedy district that the plaintiffs have asked for would put three the three Latinos and the African-American all in one seat. So there's a, the League of Women Voters has filed a saying, you know, dismiss this case, not that they're not in violation of, not that they don't have polarized voting, but because the harm would be worse than at large. Of course, the four, uh, protected class. So they, if, if that's the ruling, if they follow that League of Voters request, that would be more or less useless for all the other cities. Um, because it's so Santa Monica. In which case, the fact that Santa Monica's Latino population is 50, citizen voting age population in yours is 16%. So I can definitely see where people are thinking, hey, our demographic is the same. That really won't apply to us. Well, it might. Or it might not. We we really won't know a thing if we get that ruling. Council Member Brown. Mayor. Uh, well, so to pile on with speculative questions, I guess I wanted to ask, um, you know, with respect because the Santa Monica case came up, um, with respect to that been um, I imagine, and I, so maybe if those of you who are more familiar, please um, you know, share. Um, I, I'm thinking that there's also a question about the number of candidates in a given demographic and how many are elected. So like in the case of if Santa Cruz, for example, majority of Latino candidates have won when they've run, and not all. And so I, I, I'm gonna put it out there. I, I think that may be a factor as well in their considerations. I've been here in the conversations that I've been and thinking about this in the state newspapers. They, there is a question about whether through evidence of racially polarized voting has provided Right, because right now all these claims are being made without any evidence, potentially. And so I guess that, say something about that. Help. I mean, I think this goes, this is the, uh, the ultimate point of what the attorney was saying earlier. Of nobody has successfully defended themselves. And so we don't know where that bar is. When no one has left the bar, all we know is that we don't know where the bar is. Yes, you're exactly right. That the letter of the law, not just a numbers game. There should be proof of polarization for us, for voters, or for, the, for candidates. But the, case, the very few cases so far have been all over the board. How you measure and find that just good pieces. And you know, as was mentioned earlier, um, pieces are so expensive. 
Santa Monica won't say how much they spent. I've been estimating eight to ten million they spent on their case. I was told about two weeks ago that I was significant by someone in the know that I was significantly underestimating how much they've spent on themselves. So that's why you know, all the points you've made, because council members have made the public have made about different systems that could be legitimate are right. The problem is how much it costs to prove that in court. And one thing I should clarify on poll right on ranked choice voting, um, until 2020, all the jurisdictions in California that had ranked choice voting had ranked choice voting in district. So San Francisco, Berkeley, San Leandro, Oakland, they all have districts and then they use ranked choice voting within district. 2020, Albany is the first to go to uh, ranked choice voting at large. And it's it's not a, it's never had a voting right. So there are other there are other systems. There's cumulative voting. There are uh, other varieties that, that would probably be better options. Ranked choice voting is the most common alternative, but it's used. Thank you for that. I, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, I was just going to say thank you for that because that was another question I was going to ask about. So go ahead. Uh, I was just going to <clears throat> point out that. Um, while the council still has some work to do with respect to moving the seven district uh, election process forward, as far as the six district uh, issue, that is on the ballot in November. And so the California Supreme Court could do any number of things and that charter amendment will be on the ballot. So um, I think the question of whether or not we should have uh, district elections I mean, I think that's probably been established by the council at this point. And the focus of this meeting is really intended to, to get council member preferences on the on the map options. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tony, for that. I, I, I was asking the question primarily. Well, I, I just, I know, I think you know by now that I disagree with this process. Um, and I disagree with the extortionist move to, uh, that, that brought us to this place. Um, but I was asked mostly thinking about uh, what the potential factors for determining the outcome for the Santa Monica case and the extent to which they may apply here. Since I heard a question suggesting that, and I heard discussion that it wouldn't apply. And um, while the political will with the council, it appears that ship has sailed, I am not going to give up on having the conversation about other systems that may be more representative, more democratic, and uh, prevent the kind of vote dilution in uh, our uh, electoral, our, our winner take all, which will be even more amplified this take all. So um, I just want to say a couple of things. I, I don't have a whole lot of input on the configuration of the map. I think any map that we choose is going to, some people will be happy with it and others won't. There isn't, there just isn't going to, um, uh, you know, I, I heard people say, well, it's arbitrary. They're looking at the west side if there's a decision they don't like. It's arbitrary, but it makes sense over on the east side. And then people from other parts, you know, maybe with a different perspective saying, that's arbitrary over here. So that's just going to be a challenge that we're faced as vision. And um, so I don't have a, a whole lot of input about um, which map or you know, strong feelings about really strong dividing lines. Uh, with the exception, though, I did want to just raise the point that um, Council Member Cummings earlier, and it's, it's been discussed. I uh, Mayor Bruner raised it as well, uh, that we really ought to try to find a way whether we end up with a six, for both the map select make for six and seven to uh, provide for lower, at a minimum, lower ocean plus. In terms of the, the demographics, that's, if we're really committed to addressing um, the underrepresentation of our Latinx Community, that would be the most effective way to try to address that district. 
setting. So I do think that that may take a little bit more to, to figure the lines, but I think it's important that we look at that. Um, and then I would add, um, I, I agree with the in, right that um, that that like thing right together <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, the the one that I feel very strongly about is the the tent is the lower ocean. Left. I think there's a way that we can do that without disrupting the rest of. And then in terms, I just want to make one last comment. Um, of just following up on about uh, the trained realm of possibility that we are asking voters to consider. We are asking for that without a whole lot of context. I've had have at least one uh, member of the public showed up today and said, what is the, I, like, what is going on here? Why is this happening? Can reference the uh, web site for information on that. The page is very well organized, a lot of documents there and um, I want to thank hard, uh, especially for all of you who are trying to make this challenging process as accessible <laughs> to the public and and, to, and, to, and informative to the public as possible. Just it's a huge challenge. Um, so you know I I'm concerned about that and I I think we should I, I think the public should be able to um, vote on whether or not they want to have district elections. I think that a ballot initiative telling them you're getting this and oh but you know and you can have a choice about <laughs> whether or not it's gonna come with six districts or seven is you know it's a false choice. It's not really a not really a democratic voters here. So um, I'm gonna continue to share my perspective on that as this process. Um, I think I'll leave it there for today. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. I think Tony Gotti expressed what I was going to say, but I, um, I think my colleagues make some very good um, points from uh, diluting votes. Um, and we are where we are. And my understanding is that that we have conceded to go that direction for all the reasons that Mr. Kandati. Um, shared tonight and Mr. Johnson shared tonight. And I just want to make sure it's clear for those who are listening that what's for us right now is talking about the six district, seven district. Um, that's the decision that the council before I was on the council um, made and that's the direction that the city's going. So we don't fall into it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Uh, Council Member Golder, any final uh, comments? Or... No, I think that I, you know, I, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, work on this, and it'll be interesting to say, see which way we, you know, end up going. Um, just the map that makes the most sense to me um, after you know analyzing them and taking into account people thoughts would be 701, but, you know, I could wait, like, I feel like I still have a lot of work to do on this. Thank you. Fred Johnson, do you have the direction you need for seven district map draft before next public hearing date? Yes, although, thank you. Although I would add a, a logistical note, which is, Likely given the request that you made for us to draw, and I expect now that draft maps are out there, we'll probably get a handful of public drawn maps as well. At the next hearing, or we're likely to push fairly hard for you to narrow the options down quite a bit, or perhaps select a map. So if there are thoughts you have, um, or, or comments you see from the public that you would like to draw on, uh, please forward those at the time you have those thoughts. So that we can get them posted and live, and you can consider them at the like next, rather than waiting and then that that means saying, oh, hey, I want, I'd like to see. Them. Yeah. So if you can ask us for those now, so you can evaluate. I would echo Doug on that. The, the the sooner we get that feedback and he can generate that, the sooner we can post it and make copies and get those out. 
so that people, so that you all and public weigh in on that. So the sooner the better. And may I also add, Mayor Bruner, okay. um, we have copies of the maps here at City Hall um, and uh, sets with the demographic data that are um, nice, nice. And then I also have very large maps that are out in the lobby area that you can come and look at more closely. And if anybody would like to get any of the additional resources, I'd be happy to connect with you and they can reach me at 831-420-5019, 831-420-5019. That number is on our website, but you can also just try the city manager's office if you didn't get that number. Thank you so much, Casey. I know that um, there, you know, I share the same concern that was brought uh, forward as well regarding public outreach and engagement. And I know that um, to date, there are many efforts to uh, have community participation and um, to get the, the information out there and having the, the tools for everyone to kind of craft their idea of, of their own district map representation. Um, so I know there have been, um, I believe, virtual and in-person meetings and um, working with, uh, you know, community organizations and really um, um, in, in, intentionally working with um, um, different community groups to get that information out there. So thank you. Um, again, uh, the, the city website is cityofsantacruz.com slash elections. And Casey Emard, 1420-5019. So much for sharing your information. Um, and we hope to, uh, uh, have updated maps. Our next step will be updated draft maps at our next public hearing, April 19th. And we will be narrowing it down to um, those map options. And uh, it will be interesting to see some of that, some of that data. And just a, a date so the public is aware. So the maps for the ninth considered on 19th will have to be posted by the 12th, um, so we are hoping it, for those residents who want to try their hand at the online tool that's linked to the project site, if they can try to submit those by the 7th, um, that it is a little tricky thing. They need to submit it, time for us to process and post it. Hopefully they can submit it at least by the end, by midnight 7th process, post it and that be considered on. So by April 7th, Exactly. Okay, essentially a week, but you have to get the maps up there first. Um, they're most most of them are up there. I just seven oh one that I need. You just need to add the UCSC generated. Okay, thank you for yeah. yeah. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you for that information. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, that does conclude this public hearing on both items tonight. We received input on the six district draft map and election win and the seven district draft map. Thank you so much. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>